Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Comic Boom Comic Source collaboration. This is your DC Spotlight for the week of March 19th, 2024. Decent sized week. There's about 12 books. I, I personally really enjoyed this week. I didn't think there was uh, really anything that was, you know, awful. Some that were kind of maybe average, some where I know Rocky and I are going to be completely on the opposite sides. Uh, <laughs> that's, not a big, that's not a big surprise. It happens from time to time. Uh, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a pretty strong week. Uh, we've, been, we've had a few pretty good weeks in a row. So what are your thoughts yeah. on the week overall, Rock? Well, I thought there was, uh, there was a couple of uh, stinkers for me, possibly three or four, but uh, there was a lot of comics this week. So that, that wasn't too bad. Overall, I'm still I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it, and even uh, even uh, the some of the ones that rubbed me the wrong way it still had their moments that uh, you know that I'll I'll acknowledge, and, and we'll get into it because I hinted at you already of some of the things that bugged me a little bit. But uh, um, yeah, no, I'm in, I'll, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on a lot of these this, this week. Uh, in particular, even uh, Hellblazer, uh, I, th I thought was a little bit. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting uh, only because I was a little more confused than I have any right to be. But in any event, um, uh, let's get to it. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I'm curious, too, because, you know, as we both do at times when we hear kind of the other person's perspective, it kind of changes how much we enjoyed the book. We, you know, opinions of it can kind of come up. And that's one of the other things that almost always happens to me. My knee jerk reaction when I do have a negative reaction to a book um, when I go back and review it, I realize you know, maybe it wasn't as bad as, uh, you know, as I thought. And, and part of that is sometimes when we're in kind of a crunch time, time crunch, you know, and we're trying to get the books read and we're reading them re really quickly instead of letting ourselves, you know, take the time to actually enjoy them. I, so I do find it if, if I get in a time crunch, yeah, it's harder for me to enjoy. I think it's the pressure of, oh my God, I got to get this read. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's kick it off. Batman 89 Echoes, issue two, uh, written by Sam Hamm, who was the screenwriter for the first two Batman um, movies, Tim Burton Batman movies. Joe Quinones handles the art. Leonardo Ito on colors. Carlos M. Mangual does the letters. And let me just start off, you know, right away, elephant in the room. It's really hard to enjoy a book when the damn thing doesn't come out. And this book has been the delay was ridiculous and I don't know what's going on behind the scenes or whatever, but in my mind to have a delay this, this long is inexcusable. Like it just can't happen. You shouldn't have released the first issue when you released it. If it was going to be, you know, I think four months since the next issue, I, I want to say that issue one came out in December. I'm not a hundred percent. I'll check on that in a minute. Um, but I, I was like, Oh my God. I forgot this book, the series even existed. Yeah, and of course, it took a while. Yeah, it took a while to come out. I had absolutely no idea what happened in issue one. I couldn't remember it for the life of me. Based on what was happening early on in issue two here, I was like, wait, what? what's going on? There's talk of Br Bruce having fake fingerprints and he needs his fingerprint kit. And, uh, Winston, his Robin, is meeting in secret with Alfred at a, a auto repair place to get his car fixed because – Gotham PD is trailing Alfred and what, and I was like, wait, what, what in the actual hell is going on? So yeah, I had to go back and completely read Batman 89 echoes issue one. And then I recalled okay, Bruce was pretending to be Firefly and Harley Quinn's in it and Scarecrow's in it, Jonathan Crane and that sort of thing. I, yeah. I, whatever, man. Um, so all that being said, get, getting that out of the way, the book itself, the story itself is pretty interesting. And, and one of the things I do find interesting about it is this idea of this Tim Burton Batman universe where they're oftentimes Joe Quinones, who does a great job with the art. He's, I think, drawing people with the... Um, with the thought in, in mind that, hey, if this guy existed on – or if this book, if this story existed as an actual Tim Burton Batman movie, who would play this character in in the actual movie, right? So we see that here. Um, right off the bat, there's um, this 
television producer. He was he was in the first um, in the first issue. He shows up here as well, and he looks like uh, the actor. If people are familiar, Harvey Firstein, which uh, a lot of people will, <laughs> I, I guess maybe his biggest role. People will know him from Independence Day. He was um, at the at the cable TV or broadcast center or whatever you want to call it. He was um, Jeff Goldblum's boss. Uh, he's also in, yeah. and he's been in a ton of movies, but like, as I'm reading this, I'm like, that's, that's Harvey first thing. That's gotta be Harvey first thing. That's exactly who it looks like. So yeah, he's on the screen right now. If you're watching us on YouTube. So I appreciated that. Uh, the other aspect of this, when we talk about Tim Burton, Batman movies, the stories of, for the most part have been sort of simplistic for the first two, you know, that's how many we got. I do feel like this does obviously belong in that universe. We do see Michael Keaton version of Batman. We see Harvey Dent version of, or uh, Billy D. Williams version of Harvey Dent, Two Face, what have you. Um, and and as I said, uh, you know, we see other likenesses for actors that could be playing these characters. All that being said, if this particular story, and again, we're only two issues in here, if this particular story were to be a Tim Burton Batman movie. This seems much more complicated and like there's a lot more to the plot um, than we've had previously, right? Like almost like Sam Hamm is taking some cues from Christopher Nolan. Not that Christopher Nolan's Batman movies were super complicated or whatever, but when you talk about Christopher Nolan movies in general, rather than it be uh, Interstellar or Memento or um, what was the one with the dreams? Um, with Leonardo, Leonardo uh, DiCaprio. Oh, um, oh, the, I, 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 it's on the tip of my tongue, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it out right now as we're listening to the podcast. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, where things were, uh, they're really complicated, right? Yeah. That's to be the plot that Sam Ham is going for here, and I kind of like it. I kind of like it as much as you know the the first issue that we had of the or first series we had of this going back to you know you and I both talked about it how. It was almost like Batman was an afterthought because we got so much Harvey Dent um, and so much Batgirl um, that it seemed like Batman was a little bit of a cameo. Seems like we're swinging back the other way. But what is Bruce up to pretending to be Firefly? What's going on with Jonathan Crane? There seems to be somebody else that perhaps is pulling the strings. Um, you know, we, we hear Crane talking to some of the um, kind of the guards, if you will, or the uh, interns at... Um, at Arkham Asylum and referring to somebody else who's in charge. So who's the big bad? We don't know. But regardless, a lot of moving parts, a lot more of a complicated story than I think we've had in the past in those kind of Tim Burton, Batman uh, worlds, if you will. So we'll see how that all plays out. I guess it, you know, it just, it depends on the execution. And then obviously it's also going to depend on if they can, can, if they can get this book out on time. You know, instead of it being just so November 28th was when issue one came out. <laughs> That's so crazy. The full month of December, the full month of January, uh, the full month of February. So nearly four months that that again, it, it just and it's not like Joe Quinones is his art's not super complicated. I have no idea what could have taken so long. Um, so hopefully maybe somebody was sick or what have you, and now they're better and think it'll come out on a reasonable schedule. But yeah, that's uh, that's ridiculous. And the name of that movie we couldn't remember was Inception. Christopher Nolan. Right. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about this. It's much more complicated than I would expect from uh, a Tim Burton Batman universe or Batman eighty nine universe story. But I kind of like that. I kind of like that they're raising the level of storytelling and the layering. It's got to come out on time, though. Uh, but all the other stuff works for me. As much as I'm not a fan of Batman 89, um, I think because of the extra layering of story and the Joe Quinones art is absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. We're two issues in. We still don't know a lot of what's going on. It's been a lot of setup so far, uh, which, again, I'm okay with setup if it's going to come out on time. I'm not okay with setup if, it, if we have four months between issues. Uh, I just, I cannot stress enough how much that just doesn't work. So anyway, what are your thoughts on it, Rocky? Uh, it's it's interesting because when the, the original series came out, when Sam, Sam Hamm wrote the original Batman 89, 
uh, comic the that is uh, dealing with Harvey Dent, and I thought it was too much of a focus on Harvey Dent, not enough focus on Batman. <clears throat> but it was actually a fairly in-depth, substantive story as well. Uh, I can't help but but notice the the vast difference in storytelling between Robert Venditti's on his Superman eight, Superman uh, 78 verse, versus uh, Batman 89 here. Very, very, Robert Venditti's simpli overly simplistic uh, storytelling over with, with Superman 78. It's, it's so simplistic. It, it's, it's too simplistic in my mind. And I say that with love, but I mean, I've been, I could actually go on a little bit of a rant about it, but I've been holding back because I love Christopher Reeve, but it's, it's so Christopher Reeve. It's so simplistic. I want to give Sam, I want to give uh, Sam Ham some credit here for actually giving us a story with substance. That's actually more worth reading, quite frankly, uh, the, the delay, whether it's his fault or not, let's leave, leave that aside. You made comments on that. I don't disagree with you. We hate delays, and we're going to be talking about delays on other comics this week. But in any event, I, I do, I do I like this story. I'm, I'm really curious. Why is Bruce Wayne impersonating, even going so far as having fake fingerprints, impersonating Firefly, this Robert Lowry? Um, uh, kudos to Joe Quinones. His art, I, I love uh, Harley, Harleen Quinzel here. She's got a bigger rack than Power Girl. That's awesome. She looks amazing, sexy as hell. Uh, her her studio producer Chuck wants her to go visit Dr. Jonathan Crane because Jonathan Crane has is uh, interviews Robert L Lowry, who is the Firefly. But he knows he's he 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 seems to know that it's that it's not really the F Robert Lowry. So maybe he know, but he doesn't know that it's Bruce Wayne. But he knows something is up. So. We, that's all we really know. Everybody seems to know something we don't. Uh, Jonathan Crane, Dr. Jonathan Crane knows something we don't. Uh, Bruce Wayne knows something we don't. Uh, Winston, uh, the, the robber, knows something we don't. And then we even have hints on the cover itself. On the cover itself, it has Harley Quinn's outfit that we're not privy to yet. This is issue two. Uh, and also on the cover, it looks like there's a Batwoman on the cover. And there's no Batwoman in this issue. So we're getting teases of what I'm assuming are future characters and future issues here. And that's kind of a cool thing. Maybe it's a little frustrating, but it's kind of cool. We have something to look forward to. So we got questions. We got uh, we have questions that I think are interesting questions. And if it wasn't for the delay, I'd be even more invested in the answers. But I have to admit that, uh, unlike you, it's it's really odd. For some reason, I remembered most of, of the first issue, which is an, certainly a compliment to Sam Hamm because I, I actually was intrigued. I go, oh, yeah, this is the one. Bruce Wayne's impersonating somebody. Uh, why is that? That's all I remembered. And then the rest were filled in the blanks. But I thought it worked. I love the uh, Joe Quinones art. I love Harley Quinn here. I love... She's got a sexiness about her. She's also got an agency about her that she doesn't doesn't have before in the mainstream interpretation of Harley Quinn, which frankly I'm kind of sick of uh, uh, the blonde bimbo type. This one feels like someone. She's aggressive. She's a career go getter. She's willing to do what it takes to be successful. Uh, she has she's uh, she's very aggressive in her own right, but with a different set of motivations instead of just sort of revolving around the Joker. So I really like this iteration of Harleen Quinzel, and so yeah. This is, uh, I like this, and I like this better. Here's my outlier opinion. Uh, I like this, I, I still like this much better. This is more entertaining to me, and I, this is more, better bang for my buck than in Superman 70, 78. I, I just, I find I'm getting more of a substance here, more story, and the art is much, much better in my mind as well. And that's probably, I'm not, perhaps that's an unfair comparison. They're two very different movies, different iterations, uh, but I... I enjoyed this issue. So I enjoyed this issue. And again, uh, kudos to the breast size on Harleen Quinzel uh, because uh, they, they seem to be reducing the breast size of Power Girl uh, over in the pages of Power Girl. At least we're getting some, some Purian fanboy stuff over here in the pages of Batman 89 Echoes. Who knew? Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Comparing to Batman, to, I, I think I still like the Superman better. But again, it, it's just the Superman book is the Christopher Reeve version of Superman. And this is yeah. the 89 version of Batman, although it does seem to be, you know, building and layering, like, like you said, but it, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to compare the two. I, I, I will say that I think in terms of, for me personally, 
I'll give the nod to Batman 89 only because it's making me a fan of this version of Batman, which I haven't really been a fan of. I wasn't a fan of Tim uh, of um, uh, Michael Keaton as Batman until the, the most recent Flash movie. Yeah, actually, it's which older, is ironic that, given that it was a flop. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> even though it was a flop, I, I loved Michael Keaton as Batman in that movie. Like Michael Keaton it, as Batman in the original Batman movie, eh, in uh, two with the Penguin, eh. It's just okay to me. It's not great. I, <laughs> he's no better nor worse than Val Kilmer in my mind. Um, he, but yeah, he 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 was s- seriously elevated in my list of Batman after that Flash movie. He jumped all the way up to number two for me. He he leapfrogged Christian Bale um, <laughs> because my number one. I like Ben Affleck as Batman more than anybody else. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. I don't know whose fault it is that it's late, but hopefully they can keep it on on track. And it, yeah, I, I, I should mention when I went back and had to reread issue one, I did enjoy it. I was like, oh, yeah, this is what's going on. Bruce Wayne pretending to be Firefly, setting up this trap, crawling through a tunnel. Yeah, it, very interesting, very intriguing what's going on. So I did enjoy it. But man, the fact that it was four months, it has just, I, don't, I, don't, I can't explain yeah. it. Can't explain it. All right, this one, this next one, Batman, Superman, World's Finest, number 25. Uh, another one that I think we're probably going to disagree on. I, I don't know why, but we don't have a credits page. We do know it's written by Mark Wade, Steve Pugh, and Dan Mora. Split the art duties. Tamara Bonvillon and um, Adriana Lucas split the color duties. And then Steve Wands is on letters, I think. Uh, he's the one that's been doing the lettering for this series throughout, so no reason to think it wouldn't be him. Um, but it's basically a Batman Superman team up story. Um, except not really it, what it actually is, is it's Lex Luthor and Joker teaming up, uh, more than anything, Batman and Superman only show up really on the first couple pages, um, where they, they basically capture the Joker (laughs) who's trying to poison a bunch of people in, uh, Gotham city and Batman Superman take them out. They take them to Arkham Asylum. And lo and behold, who's waiting for him there in disguise, but Lex Luthor, who has this piece of parchment that supposedly leads to some incredible treasure, which provides all sorts of power, what have you. But anybody who reads the map goes mad if you look at it for too long. So he thinks, well, what better person to help me than the Joker? He's already insane. Um, So he gets the Joker to help him. They go in search of this. Uh, treasure, they find it, but then things don't exactly go the way they that Lex Luthor might want. He gets double crossed by the Joker and ends up having to destroy the artifact that they find to keep it out of the Joker's hands because he realizes the Joker's going to use it to do unspeakable things because the Joker's insane. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's Lex Luthor that uh, he sort of patting himself on the back the way the story ends because. You know, Superman gets all of this adoration for saving the world time and time again. But this time, the world was saved by Lex Luthor. That's his opinion, right? Except for the fact that the world never would have been in danger by the <laughs> Joker uh, with this incredibly powerful artifact. It's almost like a wish machine, if you will. It's, shape, it's in the shape of a heart. It's like a red crystal um, giant about the size of maybe a basketball or what have you. Yeah, the, the world never would have been in danger in the first place. Lex Luthor, if he hadn't gone looking for this artifact, which obviously was not meant to be found based on the map that drove people crazy. So it is your fault the world was in danger in the first place. So don't think we're going to give you any credit for saving the world. Um, So anyway, again, it's a Joker and Lex Luthor story. There's not much more I can say about it. Was it enjoyable? It was okay. When I pick up World's Finest, I'd rather be reading about Batman and Superman. Um, I will say that it did have kind of a more of a classic supervillain team up feel, um, but with enough of a modern spin because when we used to have those old uh, supervillain team ups in the late seventies, uh, early eighties, they they got along. I mean, they sniped at each other, but they got along a little more uh, as opposed to here that you know, even though they're working together, you can tell they don't really want to be working together. So that gives a little more of a modern feel. That's more of a modern characteristic of these sort of uh, villains where they only want to work alone or they, they have to be the alpha, if you will. They're, the only people they work with are henchmen, underlings, what have you. Uh, the art, I thought the art was okay. Uh, I mean, individually, the, the Dan Moore art's fantastic. Individually, Steve Pugh art is fantastic, but they're different styles. So it's a bit disparate at times. 
Uh, maybe the coolest thing about this particular issue is the fact that there is a uh, variant cover that has uh, William Shatner on it. So I know a lot of people were looking forward to that. Interesting what World's Finest has been doing. We had a uh, Jerry Seinfeld cover not too long ago. Now we're getting William Shatner. I, I don't know why we're getting these celebrity covers, um, but people <laughs> seem to really respond to them. In fact, uh, last week, my LCS, somebody was saying, hey, is that William Shatner World's Finest cover out yet? I, I really got to get my hands on that. So anything to get people excited about picking up their books, I guess. Um, so anyway, I just thought this was okay. Uh, it, one and done. It is the 25th issue. It's oversized. You know, it's like 30 pages. But yeah, it's not, nothing memorable here. Just uh, just an okay story in my mind. Again, maybe if it wasn't the Joker and Luther was teaming up with somebody else, or maybe if it had uh, something that I felt was more long-lasting consequences, I might have enjoyed it more. But yeah, for me, this was just a, just okay, just average. What do you think of it, Rocky? Uh, it's, it's, it's classic Mark Wade. He understands how to write uh, Silver Age tales with modern-day sensibilities and to tell it in a concise manner, and that's exactly what this is. I remember back in the day when I was like 12, 13 years old, reading issues of back issues of Superman Family and reading self-contained stories. This would be exactly the type of story that I would read. Uh, just, it, it, would, it would tell you something about the characters, like just we, we learn something about Lex Luthor here. We, we, learn, we learn what key, what, what Lex Luthor is about. We learn what the Joker is about. We learn what the, that Lex Luthor underestimates the Joker, underestimates his, his insanity. We learn that Lex Luthor is really intelligent. We also learn that, on, that they're looking for the heart of Eternium, uh, which is, which is a, sh a shard which was made, which is basically the heart of Eternium was made from the, a wall in the Rock of Eternity. And on the path getting there with the map that the Joker is reading, we go through, you, you go through, uh, you go through the very uh, the various uh, this seven the, the the seven deadly sins uh, and all you get reminiscent of like Billy Batson and you go, you're going through it's, they seem to go through rooms that that sh that show uh, it, uh, a lot of the scenes that you'd see in Shazam and <clears throat> and I thought it was uh, I thought it was hilarious one, one of the funniest lines I thought were they're in the the rooms with the seven deadly enemies of man pride envy greed hatred selfishness laziness and injustice and they're sitting there and Joker looks over and then looks at Luther and says look it's your to do list <laughs> and I, I don't know why but I thought it was funny I just I I I, I just I, I just thought there was Mark Wayne has a way of, of sort of encapsulating these characters in a way that just uh, this was a fun read. This was a fun read, and uh, there's a what I find what I find pleasantly surprising. And I want to throw in that Jonah Hex shows up, and I love Jonah Hex, and and because they they're, they're checking out different dimensions before they in trying to find because Joker's misreading the map and he's going and he's opening up the wrong doors, et cetera, et cetera. But great to see Jonah Hex, uh, but. To go on my point, what I love about this series is that it 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 continues to slowly it slowly increase in sales. At least now it's holding steady, and it, this was a series that nobody was expecting a lot from, quite frankly. And a lot of people who even didn't want to like World's Finest were twenty five issues in, and because there's a lot of people out there that uh, Mark Wade is a divisive figure to them, and. Um, uh, I always like Mark Wade. I, I really don't care what he is on social media. Uh, but, you know, despite the divisiveness, I love it when a writer can just focus on telling good stories and the fans will show up, notwithstanding the nonsense and the, all the other noise surrounding uh, social media and, 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 a, and a particular uh, writer writer's past. And um, I, I just love it. Also, Steve Pugue, uh, Steve, is it Pugue or Pug? Uh, I think it's Pugue. I think Pew, the genius yeah. or something. Yeah, Steve yeah, Pugh. Steve Pugh. I, I love his art. I, I, I think Dan Moore is also credited, but I think it's mostly Steve Pugh art is what I can see. But I, I, I just thought the art was great. So really, uh, just this was a really great story, and it's so nice to have a comic book. I used to always bitch, whine, and complain about not enough one-shots. This is a one-shot, and this is a really good read. And, you know, and just a quick comment, a lot of the longtime readers like yourself and my, 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 you know, like you and me, sometimes we get caught in this trap. I got to remind myself that comic, you know, for every comic book, not everyone reads comic books as regularly as we do. And 
and a lot of people perceive comics as being a little bit impenetrable. And while you, you know, most of the time, statistically, if you were to pick up a random big two comic book, you're going to pick up a comic that's probably in the middle of a six issue arc. And that's very disconcerting. And that doesn't, that, that doesn't pull, I, I think that's, that's not always a good thing. And so I, I like, I, I, I like the idea of every, maybe after, at the end of each arc, maybe having a self-contained story. I wish more writers would be inclined to think that, but I think modern day writers now with the big two, they're so afraid of being let go after their first arc that they're, they're always, they're always building extra plots and subplots in their stories because they want to be hired on to continue their subplot that they hinted at. And then the Jeff Johns trope of having ending on every, every, ending every single story on a cliffhanger, even the final issue. I mean, it's, I like just a good one shot and that's what this was. So it was really good to see. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay. Up next, we have the April special number one, uh, three different stories, all starring apes. We have plan of the apes or rise of battle for an eventual conquest of the Legion of do. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, mm. Uh, John Lehman is the writer, Carl Mostert on art, David Barron on colors, Tom Napolitano handles the letters. Then we have a Detective Chimp story, uh, Detective Chimp in Detour, Joshua Hale Fikalov is the writer, Phil Hester on pencils, Eric Gapster on inks, D. Cuniff on colors, Clayton Cowell on letters. Uh, and then finally, Monkey Prince and Call to Arms by Gene Luen Yang as writer, Bernard Chang on art, Marcella Maialo on colors, and Janice Chang on letters. Uh, so what do you think of the uh, the first story, Plan of the Apes? I had a lot of fun with this. I enjoyed this. I I, I I went in completely biased. I gotta be honest. I went in biased to, to not like this. I really did. And damn, I mean the Legion of Doom. Ooh, ooh, ah, 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 um. I mean, come on. I mean, that's awesome. You know, Justice League, not Justice League of America, Justice League of Apes. Or what is it? Or uh, no, the the Jungle League of Apes versus the Legion of Doom. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah, Whatever, I can't, I gotta sound like a monkey, uh, monkey boy, whatever. But uh, I, I love the teams here. We got the Legion of Do, ooh, ooh, ee, ee, ah, Tatano, uh, Jack and Ape, Ultra Humanite, Silverback, and 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 Monsieur Mala. You know, uh, they're uh, they're with uh, Monsieur Mala, his assistant, Igor, not Igor, but Igor, uh, who replaces the brain. And they've got this, you know, the, this plan. Uh, they got this plan to um, basically uh, take over the, the city of Bloodhaven. And they, they end up through the story, uh, which I thought it was very well put together. And, and again, a, a fun self-contained story where we got uh, Gleek from the Wonder Twins. I mean, G Gleek, my God, I never thought I'd see Gleek from the Wonder Twins. <laughs> Gleek from the Wonder Twins, Bep Beppo uh, or uh, Bobo the uh, Beppo the Super Monkey, Bobo the Detective Chimp, Monkey Prince, and Sam Simeon. The Sam Sin Simeon, he's not a private dick; he is a primate dick. So a primate detective, not a private detective. Um, there's all kinds of jokes here, wordplay, and even with uh, when the Monkey Prince shows up, he's missing an arm. That's because the that's because Gorilla Grodd ripped off Monkey Prince's arm and beat him and beat him to unconsciousness with it. And of course, for those who don't know, Monkey Prince is somebody that can separate his limbs and 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 sort of telekinetically control his limbs and put them back together again. And uh, and that leads to all all sorts of bad jokes about you know uh, you know let's have an armistice or you know look I need to arm myself and all this other jazz so there's been some there's some kind of terrible yet kind of funny yet ridiculous comic book humor here <laughs> and uh, it's you know I, I get it I. And uh, kudos to the the letterer. Um, and uh, actually, the, the first story, John Lehman does a really good job, and that leads into a, sort of a a, a, a follow up story uh, by uh, by jo Jean Luen Lang Yang. And I, I like the uh, I like when the when uh, Moser Mala introduces the Legion of Doom, and it's do ooh ooh uh, uh, um. I mean, it's 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 just really taking the ape thing to a ridiculous extreme, and yet somehow it. It's funny and it works, and it's. It, I like how when Bibbo, the detective chimp, he he seems to take off just when just when Sam Simeon and and the Monkey Prince are being attacked by the Legion of Doom. Uh, <laughs> Bobo takes off and he comes back, and you think he'd come back with members of the ju the actual Justice League, but no, he comes back with Gleek and Beppo, the Super Monkey. I mean, that was kind of ridiculous, but yet 
it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, full page spread there where it shows all the monkeys. I mean, I mean, forget about uh, you know Planet of the Apes, the movie. I mean, this is if you love apes, this is a comic you should be reading. But uh, I, I, like I said, this was a lot of fun, and you know, it's April special. I mean, there are so many cliches being based on the on the word ape that it's hard not to chuckle at this. I mean, if, if you can read this and not chuckle at least once, you're not human. I mean, come on. I I enjoyed this. I thought this was by far one of the more interesting and, and actually, I, I thought it was an enjoyable additions to, uh, to the DC group of anthology comics that we get. And I also want to say that the fi the, the last story with uh, Jean Liu and Lang is really like issue 13 of Monkey Prince because Monkey Prince lasted 13 issues. But it was actually an issue where Jean Liu and Yang actually ends up uh, scripting a story of Monkey Prince befriending his own, uh, befriending his, his grandfather, who is the new ultra humanite. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a nice sort of touching family story. And he doesn't actually turn his grandfather in. He doesn't turn the ultra humanite in uh, because they're going to be having dinner later that day. And it's just kind of like crazy. And then at the end, it's the e -E -E end. I mean, again, monkey cliches abound in this issue. Banana jokes abound. Everything. It has a little bit of everything. And um, finally, I just want to say that the middle story, which is drawn by Phil Hester, I absolutely love. I thought was very well done. I thought it had a very, uh, it, it had, uh, it was a very uh, touching story about uh, Bibbo, the, the detective chimp, uh, helping uh, a man who accidentally ends up, the story begins uh, with a young man killing his, killing his friend in circumstances. We don't know what the circumstances are. And then he, as he's fleeing the, sort of the murder scene, he picks up Bibbo, the, 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 the chimp, the detective chimp, uh, who's hitchhiking. Kind of an odd setup, but in any event, uh, Bibbo very cleverly gets, sees that this guy is, has a guilty conscience and very cleverly um, makes him realize that sometimes it's easier to understand something you aren't as opposed to what you are. And this guy's not a killer. And uh, Bibbo, when Bibbo discovers that, when this guy realizes that Bibbo knows that he killed this guy, it, Bibbo basically sort of breaks into a diatribe about telling him about, oh, don't worry, you know, you're just like an animal. I mean, just do what animals do. I get it. Sometimes you do, you have an animal instinct, you got to cover it up, et cetera, et cetera. And he sort of, he very, Bibbo very cleverly talks about, you know, being an animal and, and, and Bibbo very cleverly magnifies the difference between man and beast and and he's the and yet he's the animal bibbles the animal and so he's sort of this this guy it, it reinforces in this guy that you know and he's, he's being told this by a clever monkey a wise young monkey or old monkey and it, it reinforces the fact that he is human he made a mistake and that he's not a beast we're not animals uh we're human he made a mistake and he turns himself into the police and I just thought it was very well done. Uh, Joshua Hale Filecoff. I'm, I'm, I know I've read works of his before, but uh, I, I don't know if this is his first DC work or not. Maybe it isn't. Maybe you can enlighten me. But I, I thought it was really well done. And uh, it's called Detour, the story, and it's, it's appropriately named. When you, when you read it, you'll understand. And Phil Hester on the pencils, because it has that detective feel, Phil Hester, the same guy that did uh, Gotham, Gotham City Year One, um, who drew, who did the art on Tom King's that detective uh, work on that. But I really enjoy enjoyed this. My favorite story is Detour, the middle one. And again, I mean, this is another comic this week that I just was overall, I got laughs out of it. It made me think. And I thought that the middle story was actually touching. So, yeah, I thought this was really good. What do you think? I, you know, so this is exactly what I was talking about at the beginning of the, the episode where I was saying you, we hear the other person's perspective and then we appreciate it a little more. So just in general, I've never understood the love that comic fans in general have for monkeys and apes because uh, I don't have that. Like they say, oh, yeah, you put a put a monkey or an ape on the, the cover of a comic and it just sells. And I could never really understand that because for me, meh. It just, I don't care. I don't care most of the time. Um, and so I, yeah, I was kind of predisposed that I wasn't going to really enjoy this. Um, and yeah, I thought it was okay. But then in hearing you talk about it, I, I realized that, yeah, there's a lot here to, to, to enjoy. So you're right. 
so Joshua Hale Fikalov has done some, uh, I think the first comic I can remember him kind of getting um, some notoriety for, or, or people were paying attention. There was a, a book called The Bunker. I can't remember who did it, but there was a book called The Bunker and, and it, um, it it did really well. And, and he, he kind of got, made a name for himself a little bit. And then I, I think based on the, the, uh, the success of that was when there was some um, work that he did. He wrote, he did I Vampire for the uh, the New Fifty Two, and he's done some other DC work in the in the past. But then I I don't know again exactly what happened, uh, but I do know there was a bit of a falling out, and he wasn't going to do any more work for DC after that, and 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 ha- hasn't as far as I know until now. So you know, take that for what you will. But, um, so yeah, I, I, there is a lot of humanity to this story. Um, I'll say. Um, and so for that reason, I think, yeah. Uh, detective chimp Bobo, it's, it's interesting. Cause I feel like he sort of disappeared for a good 20 years. And then for whatever reason, probably starting in the dark Knights death metal with Scott Snyder, kind of bringing him back. Um, he's, he's sort of been around ever since then. Um, so Again, you know, take that for what you will. Uh, don't know why that he would start showing up now uh, after all this time, but you nailed it when you talked about comparing him. He's supposed to be the animal. This guy killed, you know, I don't think it was his friend. It seemed more like it was just some hitchhiker that he picked up or what have you. But but regardless, um, yeah. yeah, it seemed like a pretty interesting, uh, interesting story. Uh, and, and I did appreciate the sort of the humanity of that, the Gene Luen Yang, and, and it's really the whole creative team from monkey Prince that we had before you mentioned, it could be issue 13, hundred percent, but it also ties into that first story because we know Marcus got his arm ripped off and that layman's idea in the first story, just, it's so brilliant, right? Like the whole idea of a monkey's paw, um, you know, where you could, you make a wish, but it, things don't go the way like it that you think it will, right? Like I wish for a million bucks and you get a million deer, right? Because you <laughs> more specific. And we see that in there when Igor is making the wishes, he's being very specific. I mean this, not that. And, you know, he's tossing the monkey uh, arms into the little pit there. So that, that works brilliantly as well. So the, the first story and the last story sort of tie in together. And, and I appreciated that. Um, but while I was reading it, I was just so aware while I was reading the first story that I was reading stories about monkeys and apes and what have you. And I, I sort of I just don't care about these characters. Um, but at the end of the day, it is fun. It is fun to, to have this sort of stuff. And yeah, there are a lot of monkey gags, monkey puns, like you mentioned. So again, I think for the majority of readers, they're going to enjoy this more than me, probably because they just have a greater affinity for mon- monkeys than I do. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. But for me, th- this was okay. I thought the art by Mostert in the first story was fantastic. I thought the art in the second story, um, where we're getting uh, uh, Phil Hester, yeah, Phil Hester, and it's you know they're riding in this car. It's raining. It's dark. It's dreary. Again, perfectly suited. The color work is fantastic in that one as well. And then I I don't know that I ever want anybody other than Bernard Chang to uh to draw monkey prints like he's just he was the original guy he's perfect for it and yeah i don't see why anybody else really needs to draw the monkey prints other than him to be honest so uh that might not be fair but yeah that's just uh how kind of how i feel about it so all in all i think it is a success um i think this this book does work so uh all right speaking of delays up next we have justice society of america number nine this is from writer jeff johns Mikhail Yanin is the artist, Jordi Belair on colors, Rob Lee on letters. I am not even going to try to go back and look at all the various times and delays or whatever. This book has come out in fits and starts. I mean, we're only on issue nine. We're not even to double digits yet. And uh, I think the first issue of this came out a couple years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So you know, two years for nine issues to come out. I mean, it's not, it's not really a surprise that the sales for justice society, you know, and typically Jeff John's books sell very, very well. 
but the sales for Justice Society are com- are completely in the toilet. Yeah, uh, issue are, one, yeah. November, uh, twenty twenty two. So in uh, a year and a half, we've had nine issues. We should have eighteen. So it's basically we're on a schedule of every other month, but it's not even every other month because the first few did did come out not necessarily on time, but uh, m- you know more on time than than we've had <laughs> recently. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, what are your thoughts on the on the actual story? Add what you will about the delays. Uh, well, I, the, the story is extremely slow going. It, it, you know, I mean, I mean, it's kind of funny. Our, my review, our, my review on the art, uh, anyone's review of the art on this and any of the issues is that Mikel Janin is an amazing artist. Well, yeah, we know that. And uh, his art is absolutely fantastic here. We get some. We get some references with uh, Jay, which was Jay Garrick, Judy Garrick, and we know that uh, the Justice Society is trying to. Uh, time was screwed up with, during the first arc, which took forever. The first six issues with Per Degaton, we got the Huntress being uh, Batman's daughter taken out of time. She's now an outlier. She's a multiversal outlier, but she's existing nonsensically somehow. She exists in our time in in, in the mainstream continuity, and. She uh, she knows the future or thinks she knows the future of, or what could be. And so she wants to create a new justice society. And ultimately what's happening here is that they continue to go on a recruitment drive and they're going to try to recruit uh, uh, Icicle, a.k.a. Cameron Mahunt. And and they're trying to recruit uh, the, the Red Lantern, Ruby Sukhoi, and uh, also Michael Main, uh, the Harlequin's son. And that's really all this issue is, is, is them... Uh, continuing to do that, particularly, there's a lot of focus on on recruiting uh, Harlequin's son, and uh, we we got some moments here, some interesting moments between Quiz Kid and Mister Terrific. Quiz Kid, who's been who was a genius in the 1940s, uh, you know, he's such a genius. It, it took him a couple, a, only a couple weeks or months or well, whatever the timeline is in the story, it's probably shorter than the story than the timeline is that we, we've taken to get to issue nine, but Quiz Kid is pretty smart. He's managed to learn all of Earth's, most of Earth's scientific knowledge or the bulk of it already. So he's, Quiz Kid fancies himself to be on par intellectually with Mr. T. So he's got his Q spears and, <coughs> excuse me, Quiz Kid, what I find interesting is that Quiz Kid approaches Mr. Terrific and says he his Q spears are different than Mr. T's T spears, because he sends out his Q spheres to look for for people that need help, because he wants to help the little guy, you know, more than just what the superheroes are dealing with the big stuff. He wants to help the small person on the grounds, because he's it's almost like uh, Quiz Kid is bringing 1940s post war sensibilities. It's about helping, you know, it's about helping the little guy. It's about you know that's what this is all about, and so. He's bringing that, and he and he wants to move toward that. And he talks a little bit about his dad, his sidekick, and he talks about the past. Okay, and then we switch ahead, and we sh- it shows Harlequin's son, who is going after, you know, is treating a wife beater, a domestic abuser, abuser who he previously tattooed the, the, this abuser's face uh, with with Harlequin symbols, and but this abuser went back to his wife and beat his wife again, even though he was told not to, and. Seems a little bit kind of forced, but or convenient. And so Harlequin wants to teach him a lesson, so throws him off a building. But then this is such a big deal that the entire, you know, Star Girl shows up, Power Girl, Hawkman, uh, and I mean, uh, and I can't even remember the other uh, Salem, the Salem's Witch, whatever the hell, is, Salem, sh- they show up. I mean, this is overkill. But you know, they all they they want to approach. Harlequin's son because they really think this is a smart idea. I got to tell you as a reader, I'm thinking this is a this this idea seems dumber and dumber and dumber the more the more I think about it about you know recruiting g- going and recruiting reforming criminal reformed criminals. Huntress's idea I think it's a stupid idea. I really really do. I think it's a stupid idea. <coughs> there's a there's that old expression, you know, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But guess what? A really good idea now can be a really stupid idea 20 years from now or 20 years ago. And, you know, you can't, you can't recruit someone who still has the mind of a criminal. 
you know, they, if they haven't had their life experience so that they can achieve some kind of redemption and fail and achieve redemption. I mean, you can't, I mean, people, there's only one way that bad people learn to get better. And that is, unfortunately, I, I hate to say it, but to do bad and be punished and learn from their mistakes. Now, absolutely, people can disagree with me on that. The devil's always in the details and so, so are the angels. But I, I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit, uh, the premise is a little bit wonky. Uh, but the art's fantastic. And while they're dealing with Harlequin's son, the, 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 the Legionnaire shows up who I was completely wrong about. I thought it was Feral Lad from the future, but it's not. It ends up being Mordru from the future. He's the Legionnaire. He calls himself the Legionnaire, uh, even though there's a whole pile of him in the future. And he says he's Mordru, and he, he wants to join the Justice Society. And then, can you think of anything more Jeff Johns than once again plotting, and this is a criticism, and I mean this as a not a good one, Jeff Johns once again is introducing on the 11th hour, on the final page, a character as a big surprise, claiming that, oh, the, and just as you are changing the futures of the other villains to be, we must change mine before I not only destroy the 31st century, but this time as well. Didn't we just already have this with Per Degaton? I'm actually tired of this. Um, I'm really looking forward to Ghost Machine. I, I, I uh, of course, I, are any Ghost Machine comics coming out lately? No, they're not. Uh, how many delays are we getting? Uh, there's too many delays here. Jeff John's ship has sailed, as far as I'm concerned. And I already know how conveniently un disappointing the Per Degaton plotline wrapped up. We know that Jeff John's is left. He's basically leaving DC at the end of this. We know this is going to be conveniently wrapped up and done very quick. So this is not going to be that big a deal. And if it is, it's going to have to be another writer that finishes it, in which case it's not going to be any good anyway. But even if it is Jeff Johns, it's going to be wrapped up all too conveniently. So all in all, beautifully crafted story. It flows well. It reads well. And it, unfortunately, from what I know of Jeff Johns and from, what, and from all the delays, this is something that I can't bring myself to get excited about, despite the fact that there's ample reason why I probably should be excited about it. But I'm not. And I fault DC for that, for the delays, or I don't know, whoever, the, whatever the problem is, but I'm just frustrated with it. And my frustration is, has overridden my enjoyment of the story. And, and I don't, and I'm admitting that, uh, but that's just the God's honest truth. Harsh truth. What do you think? Well, first of all, let me throw out there, there have been zero delays with Ghost Machine so far. Are there any Ghost Machine books coming out currently? No, but soon. And there have been no delays yet. Their release okay. dates in April. They're coming. They started in April, then, right? They start in April. Yeah. Okay. So, good. As as good. I know, so I just want to, you know, put that out there. I don't want to disparage anybody. Uh, apologies to Ghost Machine. Then I apologize. Uh, my foot was in my mouth. I, I oh, hope that I hope it stays that way. Yeah. Uh, however, <laughs> when it comes to this story, there have been nothing but delays <laughs> and delays upon delays upon delays. So. Uh, what to say about the story? Can I just say that I don't, I don't really care. I don't really care about this story anymore. Uh, because it's been that there've been that many delays that, I, that I, I, I've stopped caring. I, I, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's kind of a sad state of affairs that I don't care anymore, but that's, you know, that's the simple truth. I don't care anymore. Like it, it's, there've been so many delays that, I just, yeah, I mean, you're, you're a hundred percent right about this Mordru character. Uh, yeah. Interesting. He, he is an out and out bad guy when it comes to, you know, a legionnaire and things that he's done in the past, uh, you know, against them and what have you. Um, but I, I, I'm supposed to care, but I don't, I just don't. This thing has been just delayed too long. Uh, you know, you talk about it being slowly paced. I, is it slowly? I can't even tell anymore because the book is, <laughs> is out so slowly. Like if I were to sit there and reread all nine issues, I think I think I could re read all nine issues pretty quickly, actually, which would then you know indicate to me that it's actually relatively quick paced. Um, but you, yeah, who can tell? Is the art gorgeous? Yeah, the art has been gorgeous in this book throughout. Yeah, especially those early issues where we had different timelines going on. Um, with uh, the the golden age stuff drawn by Jerry, Jerry Ordway, and then 
I think we had three artists, if, I was, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know Jerry Ordway was doing kind of the golden age stuff and Mikhail Yanin was doing the modern day. And then I think we had somebody else that was doing the future stuff. Uh, but yeah, it was, the book has been, that's never been a problem. The art in this book has been fantastic. And I, I get your point about, well, we just had this whole time travel thing with Per Degaton and, and not really, you know, wanting it to be that. And I, I sort of get that because I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, but on the other hand, what I think about is, you know, when you think about the justice society, as a concept and the fact that they're set in modern time, I mean, it's already sort of a, sort of a, a time travel book or, or, or a book that messes with time, just based on the fact that the Justice Society is a team, you know, from way back when, uh, when you stop and think about it. So, you know, if, if that's the case, they're a team from way back when, like how would they even truly, you know, exist in this time and that sort of thing. And so, I, you know, I always find that to be sort of interesting. And so if you're going to have a Justice Society book, Maybe that's the perfect kind of book to say, yeah, this is a book where we're going to just deal with constant time travel or, you know, constant situations where we're jumping around through time, you know, doing this, that or the other. And I, I'm totally OK with that. I'm totally fine with that. But you it doesn't matter what you do. You, you can't have that work if the book never fucking comes out, especially <laughs> because. When you start dealing with time travel stuff, you're you're those are stories that are sort of inherently complicated, which means you need what's going on. You need the events in the story to be uh, sort of fresh in the reader's mind so you can keep track of what's going on. Um, and if the book is <laughs> if the book never comes out on time or there's you know massive delays between, you know, this issue, that issue, what have you, who can keep track? Who can keep score? I certainly can't. So, you know, if I can't and I'm a giant DC fan and I can't remember what's going on, then I don't know how anybody else can. So I'm really excited for the um, the Ghost Machine stuff as well. Uh, and I, I think that that's great that that's where Jeff Johns is focusing his attention, probably where he needs to focus his attention because, uh, I don't know, maybe just he wants more of a cut of the pie, which is completely valid. You know, why are you giving away your best ideas to somebody else? Uh, but hopefully, and this is what why Jeff has signed everybody to Ghost Machine exclusively, so they're not doing covers for somebody else. They're not working on something else. And they're only focusing on their own stuff, and books can come out on time. And, and hopefully, that's what we're going to get with Ghost Machine. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But I'm over. I, like, I don't even know how many more issues of Justice Society are going to come out. Um, they have issue uh, 10 and 11 solicited. But, and so I think they're probably going to try to get to 12 so they can get two full trades. But honestly, at this point, just let it die. Just let it die. Who cares? It's going to take another six months for those two last issues to come out. They will come out eventually because, you know, there's probably a contract for Jeff Johns and Gary Frank, but they're working on their ghost machine stuff. They're prioritizing that. So they'll get to this when they get to it. And yes, they'll fulfill their contract, but. Just, I mean, they should have just killed it after issue six. They should have just been like, all right, it's done. Or here's a crazy idea. Here's a wild and crazy idea. Let it continue, but it doesn't have to be Jeff Johns and uh, and and whoever, Gary Frank or um, or Mikhail Yanin or, or whomever. Give it to Jeremy Adams to write. Jeremy worked with Jeff Johns on the... Uh, what was it Flashpoint Beyond, uh, as well as the uh, the Lost Girls or, or Lost Children? Uh -huh. Sorry, yeah. children's story. Right? Like he, he's familiar with what he's doing. The Jay Garrick story, Jay Garrick's in this. Like give it, give Justice Society Jeremy Adams. You want it to come out on time, and get a decent artist. And hey, continue if you want to continue. Otherwise, just let it die, because having it come out in these fits and starts, like I'd rather it not come out at all because it's so disjointed and so any, and yeah, you're right. I mean, you're mentioning these, these cliffhangers at the last minute. So this is issue nine. So we have 10, 11, 12, three more. Could it, it, this feels like it's building to something big, but we know it's not because we know Jeff Johns has already left. Yeah. Could you, could you actually like imagine a worthy story of this moment, this Morger showing up as the Legionnaire? Could you actually imagine a story that's worthy of that moment? being wrapped up in three more issues we're still on the build-up we're still yeah. on the build up. so i mean maybe 
Yeah, you never know. Maybe it's going to be leading into what's coming in September. Maybe this is going to tie in or lead into that. Probably, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't imagine this leads into absolute power. Um, yeah, how we know okay. House of Brainiac leads into absolute power, but I don't know how this because again, that J- Jeff has just been doing whatever he wants, kind of off on his own corner, and they just let him because his books typically sell. But when they don't come out, how can they sell? And the perfect example of that is Power Girl in this series. Power Girl in this series, who's Karen Starr, who's the old school, traditional Power Girl, not any relation or resemblance to the Power Girl we're getting Paige, whatever her name is, in Leah Williams series. Like this is yeah. not the same character. It's not close. So yeah. there's no way this ties in with any you know, with anything else. Jeff is off doing his own thing, not even talking to Williamson or, or anybody else. Um, and I'm sure at the end of the day, DC is just like, just, just turn in the scripts so we can be done with it. Uh, but again, yeah. Give it, you want it to tie in, you want it to, to be a good selling book, you want it to uh, be high quality, give it, I'm telling you, man, give it to Jeremy Adams. He will kill himself on this book. Give him a decent artist. Uh, and yeah, that, that would be my advice to DC at this point. Uh, all right. Speaking of new artists, up next, we have Titans number nine. Uh, unfortunately, Nicholas Scott has left the book. Regular series artist is now Lucas Meyer. So he handles the art duties on this book, uh, this issue written by Tom Taylor. Adriana Lucas is on the colors. Wes Abbott is on the letters. Somewhat of a bridge issue. Uh, it is nice to see the quintessence show up right off, right off the bat, first page here, and the fact that they're all labeled. Uh, I, again, I appreciate it. This definitely feels like it, it leads into absolute power, especially because we know in absolute power, Amanda Waller is going to find a way to steal all the metahumans powers, not just heroes, but also villains. It seems like this is the start of that because she makes a deal with Trigon here, which when she stands up to Trigon and, and gets him to back down, it feels so forced and so fake. You're Trigon for God's sakes. Why don't you just snap your fingers and incinerate her? Just be done with her. Like she's like, Oh, you think I don't have a fail safe? No, you don't have a fail safe. He's Trigon. He's got all this power. Like I'm sick of Amanda Waller being this plot device, being this, uber powerful character who's able to back anybody down. It just doesn't make any sense. I'm so sick of her. I just want her to get her come up and so bad. I, like it would have been great right now to, for DC to go, just kidding. All that marketing, absolute power, whatever does that have anything to do with Amanda Waller because Amanda Waller just got incinerated because a la the uh, snap in, in, in infinity war from Thanos, Trigon just snapped his fingers and Amanda Waller's this little tiny pile of ash now. And just then have a janitor come in and dust buster her up and she can be gone forever and never appear in another comic for the rest of my life. And that would make me very happy. But unfortunately, we know that's not what's going to happen. Instead, Amanda Waller is going to continue to be this uber powerful character, this basically a cheat for writers to be able to do whatever they want to do, because somehow Amanda Waller can make anybody do anything at any time. She's like God, honestly, in the DC universe. She gets away and does whatever she wants to do, whenever she wants to do it. And uh, again, I don't. I sorry to rant about it, but I'm just so sick of it. It's <laughs> well, you lazy. Saved time. <laughs> it's lazy. It's just such lazy writing. It's just yeah. lazy, and I'm just I'm sick and tired of it. Like, do something interesting, not just. I mean, Trigon for God's sakes, and Amanda Waller can't do it, or Trigon can't do anything because it's Amanda Waller. It's just ridiculous. As far as the whole um, explanation that's given for why none of the Titans are suspicious about how wildly out of character Raven is um, is acting, I suppose I have to take my own advice and, and say, well, this is what they're telling us is true, so I have to say this is what's happening. But again, it just feels super forced. Um, she's going in there and manipulating the mind. I mean, Donna Troy, very strong willpower. Dick Grayson, very strong willpower. They've been trained by people like Martian Manhunter about having their minds messed with. And yet here's what's happening again. The whole thing just feels lazy. It just feels like very, very set up. And we need to put all these pieces and all these characters in place for absolute power for House of Brainiac. And so this is what needs to be done, but it just doesn't, ha- it doesn't feel authentic. Uh, it doesn't have, as Rocky likes to say, any degree of verisimilitude. It just, it feels so forced that this entire issue just feels forced. Um, Again, I'm not going to hold it all against Tom Taylor because I'm sure a lot of this is editorially driven for what is coming. 
Um, so he's not really getting to tell the story he wants to tell because it seems like the story he <clears throat> wants to tell is sort of a redemption arc for Gar, who's really struggling with the way he's perceived after the events of uh, Beast World, and rightly so. Uh, that seems much more like a Tom Taylor story. Might, maybe it's you know a little touchy feely. Maybe it's a little too emotional. Maybe it's a little too woe is me. Uh, but again, that's very much a Tom Taylor story. That's kind of like the, again the impression I get that that's the story he wants to be telling. Um, the Lucas Meyer art, he steps right in uh, and does a fantastic job. Um, does he have a different style than Nicola? Yes. Does it have a different feel? Yes. But it's still very, very high quality art. Uh, and we do get a little bit of um, humor, uh, a little bit of uh, kind of a lighter comedic moment with Peacemaker, uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny. So um, anyway. Yeah, th this this was a little bit of a down issue for me. But again, I, I, I can't hold it against Taylor. I think he's being forced down this path based on what we're getting in absolute power. And just, I, I mean, I sound like a broken record here talking about how sick I am of Amanda Waller. But she shows up in every goddamn DC title, whether it's Superman, Titans, Wonder Woman, Justice, uh, or uh, uh, not Justice Society, but um, uh, Nightwing. Like everything she shows up in everything and uh i'm just i'm just done i'm just done with it at this point so uh anyway what are your thoughts on this issue well uh uh you know i'm gonna push the stop and then i'm gonna rewind and i'm gonna push play and say everything you just said but it's gonna be my voice <clears throat> that's what i'll do well, if i had the ai tech that's what i'd do so i mean i i pretty much agree with most of what you said uh, i uh now <clears throat> <clears throat> but I will try to uh, because you've already done that, and just for the just to, to play, maybe try to be a little bit of trying to look at the silver lining here. Uh, I kind of like the idea, you know. Trigon is Trigon's kind of a jerk, uh, but Trigon has a son, and he's got he's, he's got his daughter, and and of course the dark side. Rachel Raven is one of them, and of course there's the dark side of his daughter, and he wants to make sure that she's on game, she that she's that he's still basically. That his machinations are still in play, and that <clears throat> so that's why he goes to Amanda Waller because he wants to have that discussion and make sure that his daughter's because he's he's got some concerns about her because he's a little concerned that maybe she's um, she's getting cl too close like why why she hasn't made a move yet why she hasn't destroyed the Titans yet well I mean it seems as if the the dark side of Raven. It, uh, I don't know why she hasn't attacked yet. She seems to display some. Is she gonna? <clears throat> will she or won't she? She's. She seems to care for Gar. Uh, <clears throat> except in this issue, she approaches Gar, and she gets a little frustrated with Gar once again, trying to Gar trying to get his his full mental faculties back from the from the fallout of beast of beast world and so she she manipulates she doesn't mind wipe gar but she kind of emotionally mind wipes him takes away the emotional pain that gar is feeling and that's that's seen by raven who's still trapped in the mind of her dark ha darker half is you know you know how can you do that how can you do that and and this explanation as to why nobody knows what's really going on and and she's She's utilizing all her power so that even Nightwing, who has suspected numerous times already, I mean, which I sort of like that Tom Taylor knowing Nightwing's pretty smart. Nightwing has been, he's had to have his mind manipulated more than once by by the dark half just to, just to, you know, so he gets him off the scent. And, but I, I, I do feel that the story, this is really, really dragging on. It feels like we, we need to have another four or five months of fodder of dragging this out till we get to the end, dragging this out. And we already know what the reason is. It's going to be because this darker evil half is, is just having mixed feelings about it until suddenly they won't. And then, and again, Amanda Waller, I, and I'm just going to add your comments with Amanda Waller that, you know, Amanda Waller, she, you know, she stands up to Trigon, but, you know, and I can only guess that maybe Trigon, when he stares at Amanda Waller, he must suspect that she has some degree of power because it's not in Trigon's character not to test the waters. Trigon, like I, normally I would, I would expect Trigon to literally attack, to, to try to attack Amanda Waller. I mean, she's bluffing. Amanda Waller has bluffed more, more than any poker player in the world. And, and people think that she's got something to back it up. 
she can bluff with Trigon. You can't kill Trigon. So I'm surprised Trigon never maybe tried to, you know, hit her or or just, you know, give her a bitch slap or something like that, because that's all it would have taken. I, he doesn't have a brain bomb in his head. Uh, I mean, it almost makes me wonder what's the point of putting brain bombs in uh, bombs in the brains of all the members of the Suicide Squad if they're just terrified of Amanda Waller anyway. I mean, this is Trigon for God's sakes, and he doesn't even have a bomb in his head, and he's gonna he's taking this sort of crap from her. Um, but then, you know, does Trigon know that Amanda Waller? I mean, we readers know from solicitations that Amanda Waller is working with Bra with Failsafe and Brainiac. That hasn't been revealed yet, but that's in the solicitations. So maybe Trigon, maybe Trigon knows that more that more is at play. We don't know, but this this long drawn out setup is. What I find disappointing with it is that we're really not getting the type of hints that make reading this stuff fun. I, we should be getting far more hints in the in these comics as, as to what the what's the larger play here, like leading up to a big event. And we're not really getting that. We're getting just sort of we're getting the same old tropes again and again and again, and all through Amanda Waller, and we're not getting enough justification for why people are so fearful of this woman beyond the fact that she just knows things because she knows things, and same old frustration. But all in all, this 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 was okay, but I gotta say this is I'm this is a miss for me. This is a miss for me, and uh, I just it was just it was more. I, I, this is boring. It still remains boring to me. I just I just want to get this over with. I actually want to get absolute absolute power. Seems kind of cool, but I want to get to absolute power. But I'm interested in absolute power, not because of Amanda Waller. It's because I want to see Failsafe and Brainiac, which I think is cool. The least interesting character is Amanda Waller, the one I, I don't enjoy reading about, and yet she seems to be the centerpiece leading into the big event. That's an editorial misstep. It re is a significant narrative misstep in my mind. It's, it's You should be focusing on Brainiac. We are. We're getting House of Brainiac. We're getting House of Brainiac coming up, and hopefully that'll be, that'll be pretty cool, and that's going to lead into uh, absolute power as well. So there's that, and hopefully fail save start asking on Batman, that's going to be leading in it as well, so we can move off of this Amanda Waller focus, because it's just not working for me. Yeah, I'm excited for Absolute Power, uh, again, not because of Amanda Waller, much like yourself, but but for what, like, it's, maybe it's Amanda Waller, and it's finally the quiet part out loud, right, where everybody realizes that she's just a scumbag piece of garbage, she's an out-and-out -out villain, and they can see yep. her as that, and we can, and she can be defeated and get her off the table. You know, they'll never keep her. They've invested so much, and I don't understand why, because she's not an interesting character. She's become a two-dimensional plot device, as I said, at at best now. So I just, I don't, yep. I don't understand. I just don't understand why they've invested so much in her, and, and why they think she's so worthy of of being this character I, it just it boggles my it boggles my mind so i'm looking forward to absolute power so she can go away so we can finally get rid of her hopefully um yeah. at least a little while uh we'll see if that actually happens so anyway up next uh john constantine hellblazer dead in america issue number three simon Spurrier is the writer aaron campbell handles the art jordy blair on colors and did you bit a car on letters so i'll let you go first uh you said you struggle a little bit with this and then uh hopefully i can shed some light uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have, uh, I'm not going to have, I got the gist of it, uh, but the, the majority of this, the majority of this, and I read, I read it twice and I, I admittedly, I have to read it. I think I would have to read it. I know myself, I would have to read this four times, another two times to, to really get a handle in terms of what happened. I, I mean, I, I get the gist of it that this, uh, that they're looking for, uh, that, that <clears throat> I know that. Constantine is looking for basically the sand, the sand of the Sandman that was in this bag that this character, that this immortal character called Clarice was, uh, that she was gifted or give, uh, acquired at one time in her immortal life. And we get, her, we get more of her origin as being somebody who sort of you know, has slowly been rotting through the centuries for reasons which I, I don't really understand. Meanwhile, Swamp Thing is helping them look for this bundle of sand, which is in a vase that Clarice used to be trapped in at one point, and there was a grain of sand in it. And then, so they, they so Constantine manages to acquire the the vase at the end, 
acquires the one bit of sand, but he's, he's missing the rest of the sand, which he needs to save him and his friends. In the meantime, the story itself, the, the original story, I, I, was, I, I was just lost. I, I still haven't made the connection between who the guy is at the beginning, this soldier. I don't know where he is, this frontiersman. It doesn't even indicate if it's modern day, past, 1800s, 1900s, modern day, uh, although he does seem to have a gun. So I uh, saw so presumably sometime in the, in the 90s or I, I don't know. I don't know what he's shooting at. That's never made clear. He talks about his past. I don't know what any of that has to do with the story. We then switch, we get Clarice's origin. And again, I'm not even sure what Clarice's origins has to do with anything other than the fact that we're supposed to feel, feel sorry for her, that she's rotting and she's, uh, I, I'm, I cry out. I, I'm at the same point I am with uh, Spirier when he's on his flash uh, in this issue, straight up. I wanted one of the characters, I wanted Constantine or one of the other two of, to basically say, could one of you guys clue me in as to why we're in the middle of this field? What is Swamp Thing looking for? Why is he looking for it? Why are we here? Uh, something, because there's so much, so much wordiness. So there's a lot of verbosity here, and uh, there's there's some scenes I have absolutely no idea who the character is. Like I'm on one now. I have no idea why this page exists. You could have taken this page out, and I would I wouldn't even have known it was missing a page. I, I straight up. Uh, this is. So I would have to read this another two or three times, uh, well, at least another two times to figure out what exactly has uh, gone on. But I was, uh, I know that there's probably a story here, but uh, I, I sort of, I missed the gist of it. And I, it's too bad because I think Spurrier, um, it, it's not clear to me. I, it, I love Sandman tales and I love the idea that Sandman's, Sandman has basically asked Constantine to help grab his bag of sand, his bag of sand back, because the sand creates dreams and all that, and gives people power. And I get it, but the the the, the history and the trail of where this sand went, I haven't really followed. And uh, and again, I read it twice, and I'm I, I don't really understand uh, exactly what the flow of the narrative is. And it's it's I'm a little disappointed in that respect. This is issue three. Issue one started off not particularly accessible as it was because you it, it really it was a continuation of his previous uh, Constantine story that was canceled. And then he was given an opportunity to come back to it. But uh, this I, I really wish this was more clear. But I'm invested enough in the story that I, I am going to read it. Regardless of you providing clarity to me, I, I do plan on rereading this uh, more once after we're done our review here. But I, so I'll just fall upon my sword because the art's fantastic. Absolutely love the art. I just, I couldn't quite get a handle on what, what happened. So uh, feel free to enlighten me, my friend. I welcome it. <laughs> yeah, so it is a little bit, and I love the art as well, <laughs> right? But this is one of those situations where just like Flash, the art is is complicated and it's layered and it's detailed and so if you're struggling with the narrative the art doesn't really help because so often the art's impressionistic uh but i i do feel like aaron campbell is the perfect choice i thought the colors were just fantastic to kind of set the mood and the tone um and you're right there is a lot of verbosity here as well which again we sort of is, expect from spurrier uh but when you add that in when you add that verbosity and and the vocabulary the, that he uses along with that line work from Aaron Campbell and the colors from Jordi Belair, it just all comes together and it really, really works to create this overall feel for a book that's more about the feeling that it evokes rather than the actual narrative, rather than the actual details of the story of what's happening, right? And that can really work with a horror book where it's trying to be impressionistic and it's trying to, uh, be thought provoking and what have you. And so I, I really got a sense in this issue here. Um, and I've been enjoying this throughout, but you know, third issue here, I really got a sense of, I, I felt like something clicked for me. And it's like, man, I really kind of get what Cy Spurrier is trying to do here with Constantine. I get why I think people really enjoy his work on horror, enjoy his work on Constantine. Um, and I, sort of get what he's trying to do with flash by having that click for me here and understanding that 
it might not always be about the exact vocabulary that are in these very verbose expositional, you know, dialogue diatribes or what have you that he puts on there. Um, it, the exact words may not be as important as the overall tone that he's trying to set. The thing is when you do that on flash, and I think that is similar to what he's trying to bring to flash. When you do that on flash, I just don't think it works. I don't think it works because of who Flash is as a character and just because it's a superhero book. I mean, you know, maybe I should say that first because it's a superhero book and I don't think people are expecting that. They're not expecting that le level of complexity or, or a superhero book to evoke that kind of feeling or emotion or what have you. And then specifically because it's Wally West Flash, I really think it, it needs a little bit to be a little more clear um, because I just don't think Wally West – fans that's really what they go for you know what i mean so uh yeah i just don't think it works on flash but it, i think it works brilliantly here so i get that maybe a little bit confusing for you and i can understand why or what have you but that sort of doesn't matter in a lot of ways what exactly is going on as long as you sort of get the gist of the story uh, i think it can be entertaining because it's evoking that feel but i can explain exactly because i i I understood everything that went on, except there is one story beat at the end that you sort of have to read into. And I, I'm, I'm a little, I wish you had understood it better because I was curious. I was very curious to get your take on that story because I was like, man, maybe Rocky will pick up on what I missed or what have you. So <laughs> Sorry, <man. laughs> I, will, yeah, I will also agree that uh, I think if, if, if Cy Spurrier had put some timestamps in here, you know, uh, that would have been a little bit better. So when the story starts off, we've got this front, this guy that that um, really fashions himself as an American hero, right? This frontiersman, and he's cradling his weapon, and he's he's basically sitting on the border of the United States and Mexico. But this is hap This is in the past. It's in the past, at least a few months, I would say, but maybe years. And he's talking about and and his narrative throughout because it, this issue does flash back and forth between a couple of different narratives but his narrative is is sort of about feeling lost and feeling lied to um and it's all wrapped up in what the american dream is which then coincides with the the storyline and the plot threads we have with immigrants that are trying to cross the rio grande that are coming in to the united states and um and having this idea of you know what it means to have the american dream i mean the story is uh, dead in America, right? This is the, what the series is called. So this guy, similar to our generation, you know, grew up where you were told about the American dream and the thought uh, and the concept was if you worked hard enough, you put your nose to the grindstone, you could be successful. You know, you could be rich. You could, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You could have a house. You could have a family. You could have all that stuff. Unfortunately, and while that may have been true for past generations for our generation and generations going forward it simply isn't true the wealth disparity in this country you know we all hear about the one percent and what have you um it, it's just it's simply different now than it used to be uh it used to be kind of when that idea of the american dream and what have you uh you know it always existed when it was sort of crystallized right after world war ii um at that point you know ceos and and high corporate executives made about anywhere between four to 12 times as much as your average uh, hourly employee for that company. Now it's thousands and thousands of times. The vast majority of wealth in this country is not even just the 1%, but the 1% of the 1%. And everybody else is just kind of struggling. Uh, and then you obviously have the people that are well below the poverty line. So it just isn't true, right? And and that's what this guy is feeling. He's feeling that crunch, but he's, he's right-leaning clearly. And he thinks... Who is to blame for this? Who is to blame for the fact that I wasn't able to be successful or whatever? Well, it's all the immigrants that are coming in and, you know, they're they're ruining things and what have you. Again, it's simply not reality. It's not like you ever uh, have a situation where somebody didn't make it, didn't become successful, couldn't buy a house because some migrant farm worker came in from Mexico and took their migrant job picking cotton or picking watermelons or picking grapes. The American citizens aren't do, aren't doing those jobs and never were in the first place. So it's not these migrants. That's just not it's just not reality. But that's the bill of goods, right? That, that this guy's looking for someone to blame, and so he's taking it upon himself to be this American hero to protect the United States from people that are coming in that are ruining the American dream, and also people that are smuggling drugs in and this and that, whatever. And again, 
I don't have to justify this. You can go look at the numbers. In fact, my wife was on a federal grand jury for a, when you're on a federal grand jury, it, your service time is a year rather than just regular jury duty where you just do it a few weeks at the most federal grand jury. You're on it for a year and guess who all the people that were being prosecuted for sneaking uh, drugs into the United States. Guess what? They weren't the immigrants. They're American citizens that can't make many, money any other way. These are simply the facts, right? You can disagree and whatever. I don't, I don't really care. I know what the facts are. So that's what this guy's convinced himself. He's protecting the United States. He's protecting what remains of the American dream by sitting on this bank and making sure that nobody comes into to the United States. So that's what his story is. Now, uh, he, you know, again, we have some flashbacks here and there. He's thinking about his life and how things haven't worked out, haven't been great, whatever. So this is a way for him, something he can take agency for, right? Something he can control because there's so many things that are out of his control. Then the other uh, part with the main characters, um, with Noah and, and what have you, they're taking Claire out to this area. And the reason they're taking her out to this area is because we get her origin. We find out when she lost her body and then was reborn. The jug that holds one piece of Morpheus' sand is buried out here. Uh, why it was buried out here is not exactly clear other than it seems that this part of the Rio Grande, this part of the American Southwest has some sort of power we're told by Swamp Thing. Maybe it's because this guy was there. He shot some, um, he shot a woman that was crossing. He felt bad about it because she was just trying to, and they have a conversation as she's dying. She was just trying to find a better life for her kids. She wasn't smuggling drugs. She, And, you know, when he's face to face with the reality and the humanity of it, he feels very bad um, and actually helps her daughter who had already managed to sneak across. Um, and so, that's seems to be why they're drawn there seems to be perhaps what's going on. Um, and, and the power that is supposedly here is these three spirits, these three sort of supernatural spirits. And those they're all labeled as well. And it's Liberty law and luxury. So that's all wrapped up in the American dream as well. Um, and that seems to be what this guy, when he has a change of heart, this frontiersman, when he has a change of heart, he reaches out to the myths that he believed in the past, Pecos Bill, American Dream, Uncle Sam, all that sort of stuff. And he, he manages to somehow tap into the power that's there and explode himself, I think, to try to dispel those forces, liberty, law, and luxury. That was the one part that I wasn't clear on why exactly he did that um, or how he was able to do that. Because previous to that, he didn't have any abilities. It didn't seem to be. Um, but again, a very, very interesting story all wrapped up in the idea of what it is to be American and, and want to have a better life here in the U S you could say it's coincidental why that, that urn, um, because after this guy that, that bought the urn at an auction and gave, uh, Clarissa or whatever her name is, Claire, whatever, uh, a chance at having another mortal body, he, it, took one grain of, and he did this. He agreed to give her another mortal body. So she would help him open the pouch and it, and it is the pouch of Morpheus's sand. And he takes one grain and he puts it back in the jar. And then they, he buries the jar there in this place of power for reasons like that wasn't really clear to me either. Um, but that's why they go back out. And supposedly once Constantine takes that grain of sand out of that jar, then, um, Claire will no longer have a tie to this world and she'll be able to finally pass to the next world is my understanding. Uh, and Constantine's hoping that that one grain will lead him to the other grains. So that's kind of the gist of the story, but again, kind of the actual story beats of what happens, I think is less important than the kind of the overall feel and tone of what's going on. Cause these are some concepts to be explored. It's again, this guy's an Englishman, but he's, he's not inaccurate in his sort of, criticism of uh, America and what America is. I mean, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, like I was so proud to be an American, to be a citizen of this country. And it's not so much that way anymore. It's not that I dislike my country. It's just kind of, we have a lot of problems and we don't seem to want to address them. We rather would seem to argue uh, ourselves, you know, amongst ourselves about things that are unimportant, but I digress. Anyway, uh, does that make more sense now that I've kind of gone over uh, the story? Sure, it, it does. I, 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 
it, it provides some. Uh, I guess I understand more of the, at the beginning the the guy with the gun and and shooting immigrants, which I I never really. I never really, I, I never really got that. I, I, I just, I didn't understand why he was shooting. I didn't know. I wasn't even sure where he was, to be honest. And, uh, but it, I guess it makes sense. I, I'm not really sure how that thematically links to Clarice's story. There's no metaphorical ties to Clarice's backstory and his. But I guess. Well, if, yeah. The like, only thing that I can I, think is, it was like Spurrier was trying to explain why that was a place of power. Because at the end, they find some bones or whatever, and it is the, it is the bones of that frontiersman. Um, so why was it a place of power? Maybe it was a place of power because it was a place of death. Or, well, where... what's in the what's in the there, there's also in plastic. There's a there's a letter. Like what what was what's that about? And what does it say? Because it's it's not even big enough to read. Uh, do you know what it says? I, like there's you know there's a, there's a roses there, and why the roses show up? And I like I the whole thing just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because so the frontiersman shot the mother, the, the immigrant mother that was trying to cross the river. Yeah. Her daughter had already made it across. Before he went to dispel those spirits, those liberty, law, and luxury, which, you know, concepts that drew him there, what have you. Um, and maybe the reason that those spirits exist on the border is because it is a place of where two different ideological ideas are clashing against each other, you know, because when the immigrant mother's dying and he's talking, he's like, yeah, we just want the American dream. We want, you know, this idea that, you know, anybody that's here can, can build themselves up. And she's like, Oh, that's not what we thought it was. That's not what we thought the American dream was. The American dream for a Mexican person uh, is that our kids have it better than we did, which is, you know, a little more, um, sort of noble, I guess, in, in a way. But anyway, before he decides, okay, I'm going to channel the power of Pecos Bill or whatever and blow this place up and, and try to get rid of these these three concepts, uh, liberty, law, and luxury, he gives the immigrant daughter that had already gotten across safely, he gives her a note and tells her, go to this bar, tell her I sent you, she'll help you out, blah, 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 whatever. So we know this happened in the past where this guy, he shot the immigrant mother, the immigrant mother died, he then somehow channels the power of Pecos Bill, blows everything up, I guess, to get rid of the spirits. And it's his, my understanding, it's his skeleton that's there. Um, so the roses, the flower, and the uh, the note that's being left is, and I can kind of make it out. It says, uh, gracias something. So thank you, senor. It looks like I made it. So to me, it's the girl that, that uh, was able to, the immigrant girl that was able to go to the bar oh, okay. that I sent her to and was able to, you know, get shelter and build a life, whatever. Now she's coming back to leave flowers for this guy and also for her mother because she died there. And I, I'm pretty sure the girl knows that this guy's the one that killed her mother. So she's going back to say thank you and leave flowers, probably both for him, for the sacrifice that he made um, to make sure that she made it safely and was able to build a life and also leaving flowers for her mother because, uh, you know, her mother died there as well. Um, so that's what the flowers are, are for. Yeah. Cause it, hmm. Oh, actually it's, yeah. You, if you look at the last page, you can read it. It says gracias mama, gracias senor. I made it. So thank you, mother. Thank you, mister. I made it a little X. Uh, oh, and there's a stethoscope. I just yeah. realized there's a stethoscope there in the final page. So she's, she's a doctor. A, she's, that... a, she's a doctor. She's a doctor. So again, reinforcing the fact that um th that 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 those events happened years ago not just months ago so see we're figuring it out we're figuring it out together yeah we figured it out yeah it's good I, it's it's a good story i just uh i it is good I, that that's pretty cool i just uh i i do think though uh it i think it ought to been ought to, it could have been much more clear in my mind because it was it's such a glaring di digression from from the from the what the story was in the first two issues it, it, it was so jarring to me. I just, uh, I was in a completely different mindset reading it. And I, and, and now, now when I reread it, I'll have a better appreciation for it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's like to, to both yeah. of our brains together here to, to, to put it together. <laughs> well, mostly yours. <laughs> I was just an observer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Again, that's what I'm saying about the actual story. Beat. It's, 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 I think it's, you can get the gist and cause I enjoyed it and I still miss those little things like the note. And the stethoscope. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Moving on. Catwoman number 63. Nine Lives Part 5. Tinny Howard's 
handling the writing duties, Carmen H. John Domenico on art, Veronica Gandini on colors, Lucas Catoni on letters. I think the art is okay. I've said this a thousand times. When it comes to Dijon Domenico, I think his art works better on Flash, something that's really kinetic. It's underwater here with Catwoman, so I guess it sort of works. I think the story's a little on the weak side. Catwoman underwater, she's a little too formidable, a little too capable. I mean, she does mention, yeah, when I'm you know throwing a punch underwater, it just feels like completely ineffectual. You know, it feels like a bad dream. But she's going against these. Uh, people from Triton and Nemo, which is this th- uh, villain group from back in Aquaman there. And this whole idea, as she continues to undertake these missions that she knows that she probably won't survive, but the fact that she currently has nine lives, she feels that they're worth it. So this mission is to go and and either rescue this guy who's uh, an award-winning documentarian um, or at least find the movie that he was – shooting that he was this documentary he was making about the lost city of triton because uh, it'll be worth a hell of a lot of money um, and she does find him and she rescues him she drowns dr- uh swimming this guy to the surface and then uh, uses one of her lives and the guy's like completely un you know ungrateful and and he's like well what about my movie we got to go back she agrees which just feels like i get that there's a part of Catwoman that's greedy, but you got a lot of life. You got only three lives left and you're willing to go back down there and risk it. Another, like I, there's not too many things that are as dangerous to a human as being deep under the water. You cannot breathe. And if something goes wrong, you will drown. And so she dies again. She gives up two lives in this issue. And it just, it felt out of character to me for her to give up two lives in this issue. Uh, and cats don't like water anyway. Uh, but I guess the big story point, you know, regardless of whether this whole idea of her going up against Nemo and fighting against the um, Tritonians makes any sense, um, it, the the big thing to take away from this is at the end of the issue, all these people that she's robbed recently, all these people that she's um, come in contact and, and had um, sort of antagonistic relationships rec- recently, they all come together. So we've got Nemo. We've got Santa Espada, we've got Eduardo Flamingo, and uh, it's Nemo, this, this woman, um, Veronica Viceroy, or the Sea Wasp, as she calls herself. Uh, she's brought these other two together and said, who else is having cat woman problems right now? So uh, it seems like they're all going to be going after her. And again, she only has two lives left after this particular issue. So uh, this, ser- this story arc, much like this series for me overall, has been sort of up and down. Um, it's just the quality is just not always there for me. Um, there are times where I feel like it's, it's sort of average, um, maybe even slightly below average. Uh, and this one's just average, not below average. Uh, you know, there mm-hmm. are entertaining moments, but, uh, again, I, I just, I didn't think Dijon Domenico was the right, um, artist ch- choice for this. Uh, and, and not that he could have done it at all. Uh, cause he's super busy with wonder woman, but I go back to, how well underwater scenes were drawn by Daniel Semper and that future state Aquaman. Could you yeah. imagine if he had drawn this issue? If he had drawn this issue, I'd be like, Oh, it's the greatest issue of Catwoman ever. Uh, it's so good. The story, blah, blah. But again, it goes to show that comics, they're so collaborative and great art can just elevate a story. And again, this story, it's not a bad story. Uh, I, I, I do think Catwoman going back is a, just a little out of character for her. Um, because in recent years, especially with what, Tom King did, and he's the one that sort of planted the seeds of it uh, in his Batman run. Is it's, it really took Catwoman away from being such a greedy thief, you know? Um, this is just feels like something the old Catwoman would have done, right? Like she really wants that money. She really wants that film. Um, and this guy's going to uh, release it, and it's going to make what? 10 million? So what's, what's 5 million? That's nothing to Catwoman these days. Um, so yeah, it, it felt out of character. But beyond that, yeah, story was average. Art was average. Um, her having only two lives left, I think, is going to be problematic when all these people are coming after her. So, yeah, well, ultimately, this was just just an okay issue of, of Catwoman. I, I wish I wish the Catwoman was just more consistent, um, consistently good, which I feel like it was when Rom V was doing it. Um, but I don't know. Tinny Howard, it's just it, it fluctuates. Some issues are great. 
like that issue with the nuclear waste. Uh, that was a fantastic issue. This one, eh, not so much. I'm going to like that nuclear waste issue. That's an issue that I'm going to remember that I'm going to want to go back and read just as a singular issue uh, every once in a while. I can't ever see myself going back and, and reading this or even even remembering it to want to go back and, and read it. You know what I mean? Hmm. So uh, yeah. <clears throat> I will also mention that there is a, um, I think there's a Ramona Fraden um, variant for this, which I, I mean, she, we, she recently passed away. Uh, obviously was, you know, huge influence on, on me and my comic reading. So um, I can't wait to pick up that, you know, as much as I didn't particularly care for this issue, I'm picking up that Ramona Fraden cover. It's one of the last ones that I'll uh, get a chance to buy that she did. So anyway, what are your thoughts on it, Rocky? Uh, yeah, uh, I love the Ramona, uh, Fradden, uh, cover. That's why I don't know if you can tell Chase, but I, I put the cover behind your head. I put that entire yeah. Ramona Fradden uh, image behind you. Cause I knew that you would, uh, I figured you'd appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm going to give a shout out in the middle. I, I love, uh, Agulia March's, uh, variant cover. I'm not sure which one it was, but for women's history month, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. That's my, one of my favorite covers, uh, this month. I just, I, it looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, as for uh, as for this uh, story, I Teeny Howard has um, where this has failed so far for me, and and it there's no excuse for the failure in my mind, and this is what takes me out of these stories is we've we now know that a cat goddess is get, we we've known for a while now that a cat goddess Bast is giving Catwoman all these nine lives, uh, and we're we still don't know why, we still don't know why. And not only that, she got Shazam powers from last. And why isn't she using her Shazam powers now? That's not explained. It was not. It it, it was never said to be temporary. It said last issue that she could call upon the cat cat gods whenever they want. Why doesn't she turn into? Why doesn't she say, she say Shazam and turn into and have a cool suit and you know fly and just you know? I, I guess I, I guess that was not explained last issue or maybe I misunderstood. Clearly, it was just a one-time occurrence. She could just become Shazam Catwoman once. We never saw her change. We never saw a cool costume. All the cool potential fanboy moments for a cool variant cover or even a cool moment all completely lost. Everything is completely squandered here. I I, I don't like this story. I don't like this. Uh, we're getting to the end here, and now suddenly the goddess is saying, "Well, now Catwoman, now you were the hunted, you were the hunter, now you're the prey." Really? So now we got Eduardo, the flamingo, and uh, this these other these other uninteresting characters, including Sea Wasp. Now they're all going to attack Catwoman, and it. It, it, it this really seems like it genuinely had no purpose, and it was such a cool concept. I get the concept; it was a cool concept. One or uh, Catwoman going about doing all kinds of crazy, wonderful things, going on suicide missions, even joining the Suicide Squad at one point to do things that she could not normally do because she has the safeguard of having nine lives. But uh, it lacked it lacked a genuine sense of a unified purpose. It was the the. All the different adventures were, in my mind, too sporadic, completely disconnected in all ways, lacking any kind of sense, even last issue, which you liked, which I, I was frustrated with. I liked some of the emotional moments, character moments, but, you know, you're looking for a piece of uranium or some radioactive thing. Tell Superman, like, what are you, like, come on. Uh, it, it, the, the whole thing just, it, it's it's lacking a degree of, uh, I'm trying to get into Selena's header. I'm trying to see what, what her reasoning is here and why she's done all this. She's This has all been a series of adventures that's been entirely self-inflicted by her through making very poor choices. And I'm I'm frustrated with, we, we got a new mythology for Catwoman with this Bast cat goddess. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I always bitch about Wonder Woman's gods. I bitch all the time about the Greek gods in Wonder Woman because I think they're reprehensible. But their logic, they at least have, they explain their logic. They're, they're e I consider them evil. I consider them bastards, et cetera, et cetera. But at least there's logic. I can understand their sense of, I don't know what this past goddess is, is what she's doing. I want to know what it is. Why choose Catwoman? I mean, please tell me you didn't choose Catwoman because, well, she's, 
her name's Catwoman, and I'm Bass. I'm the cat goddess. You know, I'm, I was hoping for just a little bit more sophistication than, than something so so ridiculously simplistic. I was expecting genuinely a little bit more here. And uh, this here is another off the wall tale. It's like I just I just don't. I'm not even going to say much about the substance of the plot. I mean, a movie. A, a guy. A guy who's making movies wants to go, and he's he's lost in somewhere in Atlantis or. Instead of saying Atlantis, it's Tritonis, and uh, he's he's lost. And you know he, his movie. Apparently, he he has got an underground movie camera that he he filmed a documentary document document uh, documentary, and um, and he's supposed to try to he's trying to escape and the forces of Nemo. And I'm not even sure what the hell they were doing down there. They were uh, the sea wasp and her minions were blackmailing the. Uh, Tri tritons by saying uh, we're if you if you don't do our bidding we're going to we're going to take justice jordan this hollywood movie and producer and we're going to release his movie and the world's going to know where you're located well really this is the dc universe this the, is the dc universe going to care that oh there's another uh, underground city in the dc universe it's just it's just silly uh i don't know i just it, this really didn't work for me. It really didn't work. And there's no pearls of wisdom. I also, give me a good metaphor. Give me a theme. What What is Selena learning from this experience? Nothing. She's learning nothing. She's learning nothing. She's still being a thief. She's still doing dumb things. Now, I guess she's if she was actually dying and was, this is her last, I mean, nothing's at stake even because she's going to come back to life. And it just, it just seems, it just seems like, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not grabbing me. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, my rant is over, and uh, we, we can move forward. <laughs> and I don't like the art. I don't like the art. I, the art's not appropriate. Well, uh, Catwoman's not sexy enough. I, I don't like the art in this, in, oh, virtually this entire series. It's just not sexy enough for Catwoman. It's not sexy enough for the cat goddess. This should be, this should be gorgeous, feminine, gorgeous art. It's Catwoman. That's not what the Monaco's art style is. It just isn't. I'm sorry. It's not that he's not a bad artist. He's just not appropriate for this title. This was like putting Riley Rosamo and Harley Quinn, but DC already did that. So anyways, sorry. I'm, my rant is really, really over now, I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, up next, we have Green Lantern War Journal number seven. I'm not really going to have much to say about this particular issue. Uh, it's written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos, colors by Adriana Lucas, letters by Dave Sharp. Uh, I got a chance to chat with PKJ earlier last week. The interview came out last week. Fantastic. A lot of you guys really enjoyed it. So if you want to really get my idea of, of what's going on in this issue and uh, my thoughts on it, go listen to that uh, interview. But um, I'll just say that this is fantastic. This is epic. This is who... Uh, John Stewart is in my mind, the, the architect, the, the vulnerable side of him that cares about his family and what have you I like it much more than sort of the gun ho two dimensional Marine. That's what PKJ has been after. He's done a fantastic job. He talked about it in our interview, how people have been responding to it. Um, it. It's a way to have John Stewart feel different than the other Lanters feel unique, but not, not overpower him, which I think was the, kind of the uh, failure of what Jeffrey Thorne did um, where he was just too, you know, much like Amanda Waller, he was just too powerful without a good explanation. So I'm enjoying everything that's being uh, done by Philip Kennedy Johnson in this war journal series. And in preparation for that chat with him, I went back and reread all six issues of war journal and then read issue seven and I got to say, like, as much as I enjoyed those issues, reading them individually as they came out, it, they read even better when you read them all together. Um, so I'm sure for those that are that wait for the trade and read and trade probably already know that the world building that PKJ does works even better when you read his stories in big chunks. Uh, so anyway, I thought it was fantastic. The art's fantastic. Um, I, I'm probably enjoying Green Lantern as much as I ever have since uh, maybe the early Robert Venditti run. So uh, yeah. What are your thoughts about this Rocky? Gorgeous. Uh, the first thing that blows me away is the art. I absolutely love the art. There's something Montos just has a way of capturing that the power and the essence of, of a Green Lantern. I, I absolutely love it. I also, my, my favorite storyline here, I'm, 
I'm more interested in Ellie in his construct that he created uh, more to, 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 to give his mother uh, some, you know, her mother is, his mother's slowly dying of, I guess, Alzheimer's or dementia. I, I just love the fact that he's created a construct that sort of empowers the essence of the ring and, and as an essence of himself. And, and that relationship, it works so well. And there's a great scene here. My favorite scene doesn't involve John, John Stewart. It involves, uh, it involves, uh, uh, Lantern, um, uh, Shepherd. Not, thank you. Lantern Shepherd and, um, uh, Mr. Uh, and John Henry Irons approaching Ellie, uh, because they're just sort of concerned about her because she's, they, they know what she's doing. And, <clears throat> and, uh, Ellie doesn't care. And, and Ellie, it's interesting because, you know, right now, I mentioned it before. We, we, we both mentioned it and we reviewed last issue. Right now, artificial intelligence is right. It's, it's on the forefront of all the news and everything else and what's going to happen, what's the future hold. And this idea, this AI, this is sort of a Green Lantern AI construct of Jon Stewart. What is the future of Ellie? You know, it's, I think there's so much potential for this so-called construct, this, this essence, this, this ring-created version of or essence or part, part of Jon Stewart. I, I think it's just, it's the most interesting part because I know the Revenant Queen is going to be defeated at some point. But now talking about the Revenant Queen, Jon Stewart in another part in trapped in this or seemingly trapped in this sort of like side universe or, or, or blackness and trying to get out, but he's trapped. And then he comes across another civilization and another individual who he's, who is trying to give it, who is trying to give Jon advice. And it's clearly leading towards something where John is slowly discovering uh, his his power, and he, there's a lot. There's some things that he still needs to know, and somehow PKJ manages in a in. I mean, this is only a single. This is like twenty pages, twenty two pages, and it we we actually get a lot of story here. We got a lot of deep, deeply personal character moments, and we also feel like there's there's a movement of the story. And I'm really curious to see where this is going to go. And I I also love how, God, because we're reviewing Jeremy Adams' Green Lantern, the, the mythology of the Green Lantern core is just, it's becoming so rich and awesome. We got Alan Scott Green Lantern, which is totally different in its own way, but uh, I think moving that mythology forward. We have we Jeremy Adams with having a central power battery on Earth, where where the Earthbound Green Lanterns might have their own core now. Who knows with the Green Lantern battery on Earth? And now we got John Stewart, whose nature and 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 power set vis-a-vis -vis his ring is is different and grounded on a different set of universal properties and powers by the looks of things. The mythology is growing and expanding here. And it's so wonderful that PKJ and Jeremy Adams, I mean, they're very different stories and yet they're, they don't conflict with each other and it's workable and it works well. And I still feel like the Revenant Queen is a, is a multiversal threat, even though we don't, we haven't really seen her much in these later issues. The Revenant Queen feels to me like more of a threat then frankly, Brainiac fails safe from Amanda Waller, if I'm being brutally honest, in terms of how it makes me feel reading the story. Because it, it's, it's, it feels visceral, feels emotional. And a lot of that, I got to give compliments, not only to PKJ as the writer, but Montos's art just drives home that emotion in each scene, whether it's in the darkness or blackness of another dimension where Jon Stewart is, or the emotional moments where Ellie is talking to, you know, is, is talking to her, her, her grand, her, her mother. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, this is a, uh, this is really good. And, and I appreciate your comments because I've not done what you did. I listened to the interview, great interview. And, but I've not read the, the seven issues all at once. And, uh, I'm sure if I did, I, I appreciate it. And I've read them separated by a month each and I, it, the story is great. So, I mean, I certainly encourage people to pick up the trade paperback. This is going to read very good as a trade. And, uh, hopefully when the entire story is collected as a one story, as I'm sure it will, it might be worth, uh, you know, I, I'm very picky with what I buy a hardcover with, but this might be a hardcover buy at the end. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I, I agree, totally agree with the, this idea that Adams and um, PKJ are both adding to the mythos of Green Lantern. It's been a lot of fun. So, uh, All right, up next we have Nightwing 112, written by Tom Taylor, Sami Basri on art, Vicente Sifuentes handles the inks, Adriana Lucas on colors, Wes Abbott on letters. Uh, this is sort of a by-the-numbers story, if you will. 
Um, and what I mean by that is um, it's exactly what you expect it to be. Um, but that being said, it is very entertaining uh, for what it is. Um, I really appreciated the, what we got here. Batman teaming up with Nightwing and it really, I think, shows how how much Nightwing cares uh, and the differences between him and Batman are highlighted here for sure. Um, so I, you know, I appreciated that as well. Um, and it feels like a little bit of a setup, like, Hey, let, let's remind everybody who, who Dick is, who Batman is, um, in terms of what these characters are in preparation for this fall of Grayson story, which we're going to be getting pretty soon. So, uh, what were your thoughts on it? Well, one of the things that Tom Taylor has been masterful at is he's telling us that Nightwing is a great guy. We know that. Uh, that's part of the problem. And it wasn't a problem at, on 30 issues ago. It's a problem at the 30th time. I mean, this, this began at issue 82, I think. We're at issue 112. We know Dick Grayson's a great guy. We, we, we've got a lot of these character flashbacks and everything else. And yeah, and yeah, Batman thinks he's a great guy now. And that's all well and good. And I'll say again, these character moments are spot on. Tom Taylor knows these characters. And let me just say this, uh, is, is that this is, this issue is narrated by Batman, which is, I think is we've gotten stories narrated by Batman before, but for, and, uh, maybe people can disagree with me, but I seem, whenever I feel that whenever Batman is narrating an issue, I always seem to remember Batman talking about a villain how a villain is, or an opponent who's hitting him, how he's struck or how he's injured. Batman's so egocentric. Batman's thoughts are always about himself, nine times out of 10, about how he can how he can defeat an opponent. So often when we're privy to Batman's thoughts, it's when he's doing detective work, it's when he's, th it's when he's thinking about battling an opponent. Here, he's actually thinking about uh, Nightwing in a way that, uh, you know, that that is heartfelt. That is heartfelt, again. We know a lot about Nightwing. We, we've gotten the points of view from many characters. I think Nightwing is just absolutely fantastic character. He's he's great in every way. He's he's leading the Titans. He's uh, he's he's just a great character. I think it's a little bit overkill, but at the same time, I gotta say that for a new generation of readers that that that, that wants to learn something about Nightwing and maybe doesn't actually know a lot about Nightwing, you're just getting into comics. I gotta tell you, if you pick up Tom Taylor's Nightwing run, you're gonna love Nightwing. Because he is a cool character. If you got no affiliation or no real backstory with Nightwing, this is this is you know consistently. Tom Taylor is very consistent with his portrayal of Night, portrayal of Nightwing, and this here about young Night, young Dick Grayson being angry, overcoming his anger, and just how he was such a great student. He was such he was the perfect student for Batman, and and even even here like Batman, uh, Dick completely trusts Batman. Batman is always paranoid, and Batman wants to do blood work on 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 on. Dick. He wants to do, uh, he wants to, he, he wants to make sure that Dick's okay because he's, he's got a fear of heights. And so he wants to know, you know, he wants to make sure that psychologically, uh, you know, Nightwing's okay and what have you. And he's basically acting like a father and Nightwing respects that and understands that and actually gives him consent to do that. And then we got other character moments again, all these character moments, which, you know, again, they just, they're not bad. Batman telling Gar, you know, Beast Boy that, you know, you're a hero, you did the right thing, you know. Uh, so a lot of this stuff, it, it's it's all right. It's just it's just kind of blah, that's all. And it's so it's not bad. It's actually well written and but it's so close to home that it's so trope like this kid literally his parents are killed by his brother. I mean his uncle kills his parents, the kid's parents, and flees to Ho, Ho Chi Minh City. And so Batman and Nightwing literally fly him there and pick take the kid back, and that's kind of really it and all right well it's it's a, it's a nice enough story but we're well that's kind of that's kind of it like we, this is again this just seems to be filler story uh, but again is it is it a bad story no it's good it's well written it's well drawn i i, I don't mind it i just maybe uh, maybe i just ah, I, I want more i just want a little bit more excitement and this just just this one just didn't have it for me because we've and maybe Tom Taylor is the he's the author of his own success because uh, he's told us so many good character moments. He's given us so many good character moments for Nightwing that when I get a good one, good character moments like in this issue, 
I, I'm actually tired of it already. It's like, yeah, I know he's a great guy. Can we can we move on and get some action here and a little bit more substance or a little bit more interesting plot? What about Heartless? I mean, w w finish that storyline. Like, I don't know. Um, so I'm I'm a little frustrated, but I it is what it is. I, I'll stop ranting. Oh, you're on mute, my friend. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's it's very predictable. It's very paint by the numbers, and yeah, do we do we need to be reminded that Dick Grayson's a great guy? Yeah. Okay, I guess. Yeah, but but there's there's the backup Grayson uh, by Michael W. Conrad uh, and uh, Franco Franco uh, Franco Franco Villa uh, on the art, which I, I don't wasn't i guess I, I don't understand the purpose of the backup it's basically nightwing at some time in the past a nightwing like character of the past battling the joker and ending essentially on a cliffhanger but it's the last part it's part two of two with the with this joker character promising revenge on gray son the son of gray so i Again, I, I like Frank Avella's art, so it was good to see. I, I like that. But I, I again, I, I'm not really sure what the, you know, it just seems like a, what, what's the point of having a story that really goes nowhere? I, yeah, I have no idea, no idea yeah. on the back, no context for it. The only thing I can think is that it somehow will tie into the fall of Grayson. Maybe the fall of Grayson starts with Dick going out to look for uh, information about his ancestors. Like, I, I don't know. It, it, maybe it, yeah maybe maybe in the cave because there's a cave here maybe he'll you know because i think doesn't i think you're right because dick grayson goes in on a, some sort of hike and maybe he finds a cave where this gray sun character was or something and uh i don't know who, who knows so there, there, but, there might be yeah, some purpose but w w here it is you know in the dark you know time of the black death of bubonic plague spreading all across europe and we have this character that is you know a stand-in for dick grayson nightwing and we have a character that's a stand-in for the Joker. So the Joker existed even way back then. Like, enough with this fucking bullshit, man. Just <laughs> tell me a story about the Joker. That's bad enough in modern times. You know, and, and I have the same problem with Marvel. You know, Avengers BC. Oh, it turns out there was a Ghost Rider. But no, no. Just no. Stop it. Stop <laughs> with that kind of crap. We didn't like it when Rom V did it in uh, Detective Comics. And it doesn't work here. It just... You cheapen these characters. Oh, so the Joker. There's a Joker for every different period of time throughout the DC history. Like it's just, it's just stupid. It's just stupid. I just don't like it. I don't like it. So <laughs> let's move on. Uh, yeah, real curious here. Wonder Woman number seven, gifted <laughs> from writer Tom King. Gim marches the artist Arif Prianto on colors. Clayton Cal on letters. Now, uh, if you listen to my chat with Daniel Semper and Tom King from a few weeks ago, uh, you'll know that this was coming up. Um, it mentioned it. Uh, Tom mentioned that they just wanted to give Daniel a little bit of a break. So, uh, you know, he's trying to get caught up. He hasn't missed any issues of, you know, the regular series so far. We definitely uh, appreciate that. So that was good. Good that he had a chance. And, and this is the issue we were told by, Tom, that it was going to be, uh, you know, a situation where uh, Wonder Woman and Superman were in this giant space mall, for lack of a better term, and they're shopping for a, a present for uh, for Batman. So that's exactly what we get in this issue. They go to this giant space mall, and they're shopping for a present for Batman's birthday. And uh, it, it's the Andromeda Mall. We get the Encyclopedia Galactica. Um, entry for the mall they t it's got some humor in there and what have you um but i really enjoyed the back and forth between wonder woman and superman in this issue um it, it i just thought that it really worked you can tell how worried superman is in terms of wonder woman and what she's going through right now he asked her if she wants to talk about it she says no um but he, he ends up talking to her he brings it up, you know, here and there. Um, and through context, you can sort of see how much it's affecting Wonder Woman and how much her friendship with Superman means to her and how much uh, Batman's friendship with her means to her. So I think it works on, you know, a, a lot of different levels um, for this story. So, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this. 
Um, would it have been better series? Like I, I know Rocky was like, I felt like a Christmas issue. Like they're shopping for his birthday, not Christmas. But your point is, yeah. they just as easily could have been shopping for a Christmas present for him. So yeah, I take your point that it might have been better suited as sort of a holiday issue because it does have a little bit of that feel at times. And I have seen Guillaume March's art look a little cleaner than this, but overall, I thought the art was good. I thought the colors were good, and I just I appreciated the sentiment because um, there's so many moments, there's so many um, times where they're talking to each other, where they really seem to understand and it, it, who each other is. And it really sells the idea of Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman as the, the Trinity for DC. Now, whether they're the three best-selling characters, that's completely separate. But when we're just talking about who are the you know most important characters, who are the most inspirational characters that the other heroes look up to and what have you. Um, yeah, it is these three. And there's a moment where uh, Wonder Woman is talking about how Batman and Superman are, are so much the same. And from Superman's perspective, Batman and Wonder Woman are so much the same. And then from Batman's perspective, Superman and Wonder Woman are so much the same. And it, that, that really resonated. I thought that it really worked well. And uh, overall, I just thought it was like really fun, heartfelt issue that really shows the human side of these characters, why they do what they do, you know, who they are as characters and, and why it's important, uh, why their relationship is important, why they work together the way they do in terms of who they are and how they complement each other and what have you. Um, I can completely see why some people wouldn't like this. It is so far away from the tone of the series that we've had up to this point. Uh, and the, obviously the art's very different with Guillaume March handling the art duties instead of Daniel Semper. Um, and I get that it could feel a little jarring uh, with what we've had coming up. But we also know that coming up in issue eight, the Sovereign and Wonder Woman are going to meet for the first time as Tom teased when he was on. So we have that to look forward to as well. But man, I just really, really enjoyed this issue. Um, you know, much like Daniel himself, I, I kind of needed a break from kind of the intense the intensity of the wonder woman series so far we've talked about it last time we talked about how much tension there is in that series um so yeah i thought i, I this really really worked for me I, I i mean if i had anything on my wish list i kind of wish daniel had drawn it i would have liked to have seen him um draw some of these character moments i think he would have knocked out of the park but again i totally get that <laughs> It's with as detailed as his art is and as fantastic as he is as an artist, um, he probably needed a month to to get a little bit ahead, you know, because um, I know he's been killing himself. And, and again, we talked about, a lot about delays in this issue uh, or in this episode with other series. Wonder Woman's been coming out on time and Daniel's been absolutely killing it on the art. So, um, you know, I don't mind him taking a month off. Hopefully he's working a little bit ahead. Um, to build up a little bit of a cushion. So, uh, yeah, I know I, I like this a lot more than you, Rocky. What are your thoughts on it? Well, like I said, I, I don't mind. As far as an issue, the issue goes, first of all, I, I love Guillaume March's uh, art. I, I've got, I've got a whole, I got a couple, bo I, I got it. Well, almost a full long box of just his art. So I love his interior art, and I, I quite enjoyed seeing that in this issue. I didn't mind it. Uh, let, let me rephrase that. I love his mar art. I didn't want to see anybody uh, else's art other than Daniel Simpere's in this issue. But um, I am, um, look, I do. A, he, Daniel Simpere needs time. That's fine. But unlike you, no, I, this, this is, I think this is a horrendous thing that is this break. Uh, we, we finally build momentum. Wonder Woman has now caught by the Sovereign and now we're having a one, a one month break. This completely kills the momentum for me. Uh, and uh, I had a lot of excitement build up, and this is a this is absolutely stops it. What what makes it even worse in my mind, from a storytelling point of view, is Tom King tries to make this fit in by saying something I think asinine by saying that this takes place uh, after issue five, but before the events of what? what? So you're telling me that after so obviously to, it has to take place before issue six because issue six ends with her captured by the sovereign. All right, so we so at the end of issue five, 
Wonder Woman deci- decides the, the United States is at war with uh, with the mascara. She decides, oh, it's Batman's birthday. I gotta go as Superman to the to to a giant super mall in the middle of of uh, twenty eight fourteen sec- sector twenty eight fourteen in space. It's it. Uh, I I don't buy it now. I get it. You have to have an excuse for Wonder Woman to have a conversation with Superman to so to justify why Superman, the truth, trust us, and the American way guy, why isn't he getting involved in interfering with Wonder Woman, which, by the way, he absolutely should be doing, and which Wonder Woman, by the way, doesn't answer his questions, which is not something I would expect a friend to do. Superman doesn't hold her accountable. She's At one point, she even cries, and I'm not even sure why. Because uh, some of these moments, I, I didn't quite like you. I don't quite see these those touching moments that 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 you see there. I I saw it in some aspects, but to me, this whole thing just felt off to me. It whole it just felt off. But I'm I'm prepared to let it go. I am. I I am I am prepared to let it go because it's Daniel Semper needs a break. I if when they put this trade together, leave this issue out. When they put the trade together, leave issue, leave this issue completely out. We don't need to know why Superman. I guessed, I guessed, and why Superman wasn't interfering. And it's the same reason why the entire Justice League isn't inter, is, is not interfering. It's because Tom King doesn't want them to interfere. That's the reason. That's the reason. If the United States is at war with the mascara, of course superheroes are going to be involved more than just Wonder Woman. Of course they're going to get involved. And and I get that. It's the same. It's the same conceit when Batman's in Gotham City and there's another there's another huge Gotham war. Justice League's nowhere to be found. Apparently they, it's sort of like an unwritten code. It's like we had back in the 80s, early 80s. There's always this unwritten code uh, where, you know, Firestorm is in charge of his city, Central City is the Flash. You know, if there's something going on, you just leave it alone. Let them let them deal with it. So this is a Wonder Woman thing. But now, uh, some of the some of the moments here. Um, uh, one of the things I did like, I liked the fact that Superman kept trying to get information. He kept poking at her saying, you know, can, can let us help you. Let me help you, Diana. I'm, I'm, I, I'm capable of helping you. Uh, let me help you. Uh, I can help. I'd like to, uh, she's saying this is an Amazon problem. He, he at one point said, no, this, this is also an American problem. Let me help you. I mean, he even said, I'm the American way guy. That dialogue I liked. That, that so uh, you know and but it never went it never quite went far enough because like at one Wonder Woman clearly was uncomfortable she got up and she left the conversation never shared with Superman her thoughts never shared with him what she knew like this was this is something that involves mil- hundreds of millions of lives three hundred and thirty million Americans and for 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 them to go shopping and not have a more in depth conversation I get it Tom King doesn't want to play his hand but. For somebody who I'm invested in this story, I've been enjoying it. I wanted a little bit more, but I actually feel a little bit like a jerk being critical of this issue because it's a shopping issue. It's meant to be fun, and it had its funny moments, and they're eating ice cream, and and they have got a selfie together, and yeah, I get it. So I kind of feel bad even being critical of it, but I can't help to be because, and this is an underhanded compliment to Tom King and Daniel Semper, I love the momentum. I didn't want a break. I was looking forward to issue seven and I got a shopping. I mean, I mean, literally I got a, I got an issue of shopping and a glorified conversation between two members of the Trinity, which I just didn't need because I knew why Superman, of course the Trinity, Batman and Superman are respecting Wonder Woman and they're standing back because she asked, Batman doesn't even need to be told to not interfere with Wonder Woman. He's in the Batcave. Uh, but in any event, I, I didn't mind it. And my rant here is it's, I don't intend it to be really scathing because the art's fantastic. And I, I have to say, I laughed out loud. My favorite line was when Superman says, uh, uh, by the way, did you, uh, I discovered I had the power to sup and Wonder Woman says, what is sup? And he goes, nothing much. What's up with you? <laughs> I laughed at that. I was funny, okay? And it had other funny moments like that. So I you know, so I get it. So I, I do want to give Tom King. I mean, there were some funny moments here. Humor is tough to pull off in comics. Uh and and it did work here. There were some crazy alien moments, which which I you know I enjoyed this uh and even the, the you you mentioned the Encyclopedia Galactica. I mean, yeah, this it's clear to me that Tom King put a lot of work into this issue. Uh and it's, you know, I, 
I will say that while I wasn't a huge fan of his Batman run, so one of the issues that I enjoyed was the dating issue with Lois and Lois and Clark and and Selena and 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 Bruce and when they went on dates and and this is one where you know having these two together it was kind of interesting too. I would actually love to see a Lois and uh, Clark and and Diana and Steve uh, double date, uh, but that's probably a little bit too close to the vest. I I don't know, but anyways, so as I'm. I enjoy these types of issues. I just, it's very jarring for me. And I, I hope that, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm quite certain. I, I suspect I'm not going to be alone with being frustrated because I got to tell you, when I first read this, I was borderline angry. I was very upset uh, and it had nothing to do with the, it was just like, why are we getting this? Because uh, I don't, I don't, Daniel Semper, he's a God. He doesn't need a break. Don't tell me he needs a break. He's my favorite artist. He's got to put it on. Come on. Uh, but that's, that's just the way it is. It's, this is a first world problem I'm, I'm currently experiencing, but it's a, uh, I'm looking forward to the next issue. Let's put it this way. This not, now this whets my appetite all the more for the next issue, because I know Wonder Woman is going up against the sovereign and, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, so good issue, but Man, I just didn't want it to, uh, I, I didn't, I, I, I wanted, I, I wanted issue, apparently I wanted issue eight, not issue seven. So that's my rant. Yeah, I mean, yeah the guy, he hasn't missed an issue yet, so I don't begrudge him needing, uh, needing an issue off. I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I'm curious to see what, what what's going to happen next, but uh, I, I wasn't angry. I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, the fact that he's, drawn every issue and wants to draw every issue of, of the main story is fantastic. So, I mean, the other option, I heard some people say, well, may, why not just skip a month? You know, we just talked about delays and whatever, and Wonder Woman sales have been very good. So I, I just yeah. think these, they probably didn't want to skip an issue. Uh, yeah, which again, pretty sure that's it. They, yeah, they don't want, um, they don't want the momentum of Wonder Woman being damaged. So, uh, anyway, up next, we have Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, issue number six. Only one issue left after this, uh, written by Brian Buccioletto, Christian Duce, and Tom Dernick on art, Luis Guerrero on colors. Uh, Fast-paced, tons of action in this issue, Rocky. What would you think? Uh, yeah, you're right. And you talk about action. Uh, one, I got to give uh, Brian Buccioletto a uh, Busaletto, the writer, does a fantastic job here. This is nothing. This has been a, a complete adrenaline rush of a series. It's nonstop. Every issue has got substance. It's got. It's got. It, it's none of its filler. Every page tells something here. And thank you, uh, Brian Busaletto, for the, the very first page. We get an awesome spread with all all of the heroes at a at, at a what looks like a Justice League meeting, where we get a believable recap as to what's happening we know that superman is down supergirl is missing shazam is hostage to the legion of doom the toy man is missing and the dreamstone is still missing and godzilla is uh, tr is trained by ent metal chains at the bottom of the ocean while atlantis is being repaired meanwhile we got kong uh we, we got kong <laughs> being controlled by gorilla grod uh, gorilla grod is mentally telepathically controlling supergirl and kong is in f is helping supergirl and so supergirl's on the legion of doom side and they've got a they've got to spread they got to spread their forces to deal with all this and and how they do it is just awesome. Batman takes off, and I think Batman removes Superman's body, and Superman ends up at the end uh, confronting Godzilla at the bottom of the ocean. So what? where does Batman take Superman's body? We don't know, but he's rejuvenated at the end of the issue. We end. We we got uh, we got a Mecha Godzilla controlled by Lex Luthor, who wants to be the Titan. He wants to be the Apex Titan, uh, as he's because there's three other Titans that are moving toward inland, particularly Metropolis, uh, where they're going to be uh, they're going to be near Centennial Park, where Batman wants all the heroes to go to fight to to, to have their the big battle against the Titans. And so we got Mecha Godzilla controlled by Lex Luthor. We got, of course, Batman has to have his giant Batman Transformer suit, whatever he calls it and then of course green lantern you know green lantern has his he calls it his a uh, green lantern robo he calls it i mean this is just i mean this this is just fun this this, this is fun and and it's 
And it's uh, it just makes sense. It makes sense, and it's it's what the, it's what the heroes absolutely need to do. And it's always good to have an in-story explanation or one that's it possesses a high amount of that word again verisimilitude. Where of course Green Lantern would do this. Of course Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne, and Batman has the Flash help him build a Robo Transformer outfit at super speed. <laughs> I mean, it's so the, the silliness factor of it is grounded in 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 Godzilla and King Kong madness, the type of stuff you'd see on the movies, and it works. And I also want to give credit to uh, Busolero's uh, scripting of uh, choreographing of the fight scenes. These are really good fight scenes which take place, and every single page is just it's something is happening there's action galore uh, supergirl taking out donna troy uh controlled by grod batman in his big bat robo suit shooting uh shooting the telepathic controller off gorilla zod to to loosen his telepathic control over supergirl so that her and kong can finally get on the good guy's side and uh and of course aquaman just being kick ass you know uh where grod says kill fish man too aquaman says you're welcome to try uh while kid flash comes in there and, and tries to take out grod i mean just it, there's just go 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 action and it's just it's a lot of fun this has been this has been in terms of pure fun and just good plotting good plotting and good action, great art by Christian Ducey and Tim uh, Tom Derenick on the art. Fantastic, Louis Guerrero, colorist. It's just, it really is. It, this is a, a sheer joy to read. This is the best big event, and I consider this a big event. This is the big event that more people should be talking about. I think some people are, but this is the big event that I think, I don't know what the sales like this are like, but I hope they're high. They deserve to be high. This is a lot of fun. And this is issue six. So I don't know how many issues this is. Is this is this twelve issues or seven? Seven, seven issues, yeah. Oh, seven. So we're look I'm looking forward to see to see how this ends. But you know, it ends on a fantastic cliffhanger with uh Superman approaching Godzilla, who's chained by nth metal at the bottom of the ocean, saying we have unfinished we have unfinished business. And so I'm looking forward to see how this ends, and uh, it's, it's it's good stuff. I again, this is one of the ones that just put a big shit eating smile on my face by the time I was done reading it. What about yourself? Yeah, I mean, that's just we we have continually talked about this as just being a really fun series, right? That that's been the thing we keep saying time and time again. This series is just so fun, um, and and that's what it's been. It's been so fun the, the entire time, and so. Um, I, you know, you can't really say much more than that. Uh, it, it makes you smile. It's been absolutely fantastic the entire time. And, uh, I just, yeah, it, the only thing, the only nitpick of it, you know, if I'm looking for something, the art's been fantastic as well. Um, the only nitpick, so this is the first issue that I've had where I feel like the pacing it, it's, it's, it's been a pretty fast pace, but I almost feel like this was the first one where I felt like maybe we skipped over some stuff. We know at one point Superman's body just disappears. Lois is kind of, you know, at his bedside and then she looks up and he, he's just gone. He's just not in there. And then he shows up on the last page saying, Godzilla, we have unfinished business. Don't know exactly what happened there. Um, and then also the, the, the battle as it starts uh, in Metropolis against the Titans, uh, these Titan monsters and uh, the Legion of Doom is there as well. Kind of three different sides um, that felt a little rushed as well just getting there but again i'm sure it's just due to real estate on the page that brian didn't have time to flush that out it would have been nice to have this have it flushed out a little more it would have been nice you know as i'm realizing that there's only one issue left i'm like no i want this to keep going i wish this had been a 10 or a 12 issue series because then we probably would have had a little bit more of that but uh it's been working as a kind of a fast-paced story so i don't mind that necessarily um but yeah it's been a, it's been a whole heck of a lot of fun so Oh, and, and uh, per guy God, per guy Gardner, we hardly knew thee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's the shaft for sure. Uh, all right, up next, last book we're going to talk about in detail: Superman number twelve, written by Joshua Williamson, art by David Baldione and Norm Ratman, colors by Rex Locus, letters by by Ariana Mayer. Interesting issue here. Um, as Farm and Graft, we saw last issue release this kryptonite gas. It's going to kill everybody in Metropolis. And so it's up to Superman and or Lex Luthor to save the day. Also, we have Lex 
uh, Lex's mother who's out there um, in her arm in her armor uh, or in Lex's armor that you know she took over for herself um, th and that he needs to uh, to stop as well. So Superman reluctantly stays behind at super core because Lex says, hey, uh, if, the, if you put on the armor and it cracks even for a second, you know, you'll, you'll be killed even quicker than, than I would be. Um, and so Superman reluctantly stays behind, searching for a way to neutralize the gas. He does, along with the employees of, um, of super core, find a way. I like the way Williamson did that. This whole idea of this mutated kryptonite or supercharged kryptonite and the reason for that, it's been um, exposed to yellow sun radiation, which makes sense, right? That's what powers up Superman himself. He's Kryptonian. Obviously, kryptonite is from Krypton as well. So why wouldn't it be um, powered up as well if it's uh, exposed to, uh, you know, concentrated yellow sun radiation? So, you know, I thought that was really fantastic. I thought the way that they neutralized it made sense and what have you. It was, for once, it was cool to see Luther being the hero because you can tell he's a reluctant hero. And even when he's out there, he, he's more focused on stopping his mother because that reflects poorly on him as opposed to actually stopping the Krypton gas. And they have to sort of pull him out of that, pull Lex out of that and refocus him on what he needs to be doing. Um we get a little bit more context of uh, farm and graft and what their relationship is and why it is so antagonistic against Lex. And so, yeah, ultimately this felt like a, a really good story um, that made a lot of sense. Now there could be an argument made and I, I got a little bit of a sense that based on the length of this arc, I mean, th this has basically been the entire Superman series up to this point, right? Two, two arcs, two six issue arcs so far, but it's all been, you know, the first six issues, farm and graft powering up old classic Superman villains and then setting them after Superman to make Luther look bad. And then the second one putting the actual Superman revenge or Lex Luthor revenge squad together, wanting to defeat Superman, wanting to defeat Lex. So the whole 12 issues has been leading up to this issue. I could see some people making the argument that it all wraps up pretty neatly. It feels a little bit anticlimactic. It goes out with a little bit of a whimper instead of a bang. Especially because, in a way, Superman's on the sidelines when everything is resolved. Um, I don't know. It just it didn't have that big heroic moment that you would want, uh, you know, basically a 12-issue arc to have to resolve things. Um, but, again, things were resolved in a way that made sense. We do know we have the House of Brainiac series uh, or event coming up next. The fact that Lobo's in it, ah, man, I'm really not a Lobo fan. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, I think Brainiac needs to have a little bit more of a spotlight on him instead of always, you know, Lex Luthor, always the Joker, always Amanda Waller. So uh, I'm looking forward to this House of Brainiac series and we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, the art by Baldion and Norm Ratman is fantastic throughout. Um, I particularly liked the, the scene where Superman was given a pep talk to the employees of Supercore. You know, he's he's just barely um, been sort of uh, cured of the kryptonite radiation that he was exposed to a couple of issues ago. He's still in a kind of a Superman bathrobe, <laughs> which I just got a kick out of in that scene. If you're watching us on YouTube, Rocky yeah. has it up on the screen. Uh, I was like, wait, why does his cape look like that? Oh, that's not his cape. He's still wearing his. Superman bathrobe from when he was. It looks good though. It looks cool in it. Yeah. I think it looks. He rocks it. <laughs> yeah, it looks really great. Uh, so, or or could you could maybe you know he's there working in the lab. Maybe it's Superman lab coat. Either way, it looks great <laughs> yeah. uh, with blue and red lapels and what have you. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think Williamson continues to do a really great job. Not my favorite uh, issue of the series so far, but uh, but he really solid, really solid. It's been. Superman has been high quality as well as action comics for a long time. We've been, uh, been very spoiled with our Superman books lately. So what are your thoughts on this one? I thought this wrapped up uh, nice and w well, and I, th I think it wrapped up well enough in particular because uh, we know, we know, and it's essentially hints strongly hinted at at the end of this, that, you know, that it was, it's obviously Brainiac that has been responsible for farm and graft coming out of the woodwork now, <clears throat> because at the end of this uh, issue, 
when Lois and Clark are sort of reviewing what, what has happened, L Lois first says that Jimmy did a great job managing the planet on his own, he even managed to put out, it was the first time Jimmy Olsen uh, managed to put together the paper himself, to, to pick the front page and everything. And so good on for Jimmy Olsen, so expect a promotion for Jimmy Olsen in the future. And second, Clark wonders, how did Farm and Graf come out of the woodwork now? Because if they wanted to get revenge on Lex Luthor, why did they wait so many years? What prompted them to come out now? What was the formative event or motivation to do so and it would appear that that's likely uh brainiac himself probably encouraged it because and when you think about it brainiac working in conjunction with amanda waller you know with, with failsafe fostering chaos in metropolis through farm and graft it's sort of in keeping with what we know to be the plot points uh moving into absolute power so uh i think that works reasonably well and and for that reason i, I didn't mind i'll agree with you that there's been some convenience in the in the in the in the wrapping up of the plot but it does work and i also like i like what lena did i like lena who's got issues with her grandmother and with of course her father and it was lena uh, luther who 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 made the decision to gave the order to shut the power off of lex luther's suit and his and her her grandmother's suit uh, even though it would piss off her father who was fighting her i, I like that she did that so there was uh, i like that she got that little you know poke in because uh, we know that lena is the, you know lena luther is she we haven't we're just getting to know her really uh, under under Williamson anyway. And so I actually I'm very intrigued by her, as you've mentioned before, and uh, as is uh, clearly pointed out by the uh, by the uh, fantastic art by uh, David Baldion and Norm Rapmund. Uh, she's got the Brainiac symbol on her forehead. So maybe is is Lena Luther? Is she maybe a pawn of Brainiac that we're not aware of? Maybe she's just playing possum. Is she going to be taken over? Uh, so clearly, there's there's a lot more at play here. Probably, what's happening is exactly how Brainiac has planned it. I would guess, but I think that all of this, I think all of this is probably going to be moving quite smoothly into the house of uh, Brainiac and into absolute power. And I'm enjoying this. I'm you know. It, one of the things about absolute power, about absolute power, just to digress a little bit on that, is you and I have we've re repeatedly sort of bitched a little bit about Amanda Waller and vented about her, but at least with absolute power, there the central villains of it, it we for me at least, there's two thirds that I can look forward to. There's the failsafe, which I think is awesome. I love failsafe as a character and the potential and how he might be at work as a really world villain uh on a in a big event and then of course brainiac and i i'm looking forward to house of brainiac i like fail safe less so amanda waller but i kind of like where all this is headed and you know it's funny just a quick digression as well another quick point remember uh jace all those issues we reviewed where brainiac was in the milestone comics <laughs> where uh with icon and rocket and brainiac would show up and it's like we're thinking like why is brainiac here and uh and and uh, even when it was Icon versus Rocket, and he was Brainiac, seemed to detect all this 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 great uh, Kryptonian like power, but it wasn't a Kryptonian. There's no Kryptonians on that Earth. And then that that same Brainiac ends up on our Earth for absolute power. I kind I kind of like the some of the loose threads that are there, and so I have to say, as much as I have some concerns about absolute power and everything else, it's it's the threads dc is in a better place than it was two or three years ago that the threads are a little are easier to trace the tethers are there between the various comics uh there's still some issues we have but you know i i've been hard on williamson before uh but you know i have been enjoying his superman loved his robin um less so some other things but i i thought this was uh i thought this was good and and a, and a nice Ending with Superman issue 12, this is, overall, this has been, a, I think, a fairly decent week for comics. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. I don't know what it is about Williamson's writing, um, because he does some really great things, but then there, there's things that just, it's almost like he just doesn't quite get over the the hump um, and get the respect that he, he maybe deserves, right? Like... Uh, your argument could be made that he's done as much for DC as Scott Snyder. Um, it's a debate you could have, right? But Snyder's introduced some some characters that have gone on to be, you know, really impactful, really, um, you know, concepts that have gone to other things, whatever. Court of Owls, big one, obviously. Batman Who Laughs Last, as much as I hate that character. The whole dark multiverse Batman mashup characters. Here, Williamson tried to, in this 
arc. Uh, try to create a character really like the chains, you know, really could give Superman a run for his money and what have you. And maybe it's because he introduced him as part of a, an ensemble, part of a villain team, but going against Superman. But do you, I just don't get the sense that the chained is really going to be this long lasting doomsday level character, which he was kind of marketed as. Uh, he just doesn't feel like that, that dangerous, like that formidable. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I sort of, I don't know. I think it has to do with Williamson. Maybe his just his style of writing or what have you. So uh, anyway, that does it for the books we're going to talk about in detail this week. As far as uh, trade collections that are out, Superboy, The Man of Tomorrow, which was that series written by Kenny Porter. All six issues are collected in trade. I enjoyed that one. Uh, Janoy Lindsay does the art. Super uh, Superboy, um, Connell off in space, kind of trying to find his own way. I thought it was uh, done really well. Certainly enjoyed it more than the the backup where there was talk of Superboy becoming transgender or something like that. I, I, yeah, that, was, that was just, I mean, yeah. I don't, I, I don't think Magdalene Visaggio is a terrible writer at all, but I just think that was a bad, just a bad idea. Um, yeah. So, and apparently DC editorial did too, because they didn't pursue it. Uh, so anyway, uh, that, I think that Superboy man, of, and the other thing about that, backup it just it coming on the heels of the Superboy man of tomorrow which seemed to resolve a lot of the identity issues and him feeling redundant that was in my mind that that was successful i, I like that series that kenny porter did so uh, anyway also harley quinn volume five who killed harley quinn uh that collects harley issues 23 to 27 that's the stephanie phillips run with i art by mateo lolly uh we've got justice league the new 52 book one trade paperback so this collects it's a huge omnibus uh, it collects issues one through 17 of Justice League, as well as Aquaman 14 through 16 um, that uh, crossed over with Justice League. All of it's written by Jeff Johns. This is the new 52 Justice League starting. Um, and then the I think it was Kingdom of Atlantis crossover with uh, with Aquaman. So you've got the artists on this. So in new 52 Justice League launch, it was Jim Lee on art. And then... Uh, Paul Pelletier took over and then Tony Daniel did some issues as well. And it's Yvonne Reis art over in the Aquaman book. So that, that book, as far as the art goes, is absolutely good. It doesn't get any better than those, those artists right there. Uh, we've also got the fourth world omnibus volume two collects a bunch of Mr. Miracle new God stuff. I won't go through the list uh, cause it's really long, but um, the thing is huge. It's uh, see if it says how many pages. I guess it doesn't say, but, um, oh, here it is. 1,264 pages. <laughs> wow. Of, of Jack Kirby, fourth world DC goodness. Uh, there's also stuff written by Jerry Conway, Paul Levitz, Paul Kupperberg, Don Newton, Keith Giffen. So it's a ton of stuff, 125 bucks. Um, so if you're a fan of Kirby and fourth world, you might want to check that out. And then finally, Task Force Z volume two, what's eating you. This collects the Matthew Rosenberg Task Force S. X series, uh, the final six issues, issues seven through 12. So um, that's what's out as far as collections this week. Uh, what do you have for your book of the week, Rocky? Uh, my book of the week is, let me see. Uh, it is a toss up. Uh, it's between Justice League v. Godzilla v. Kong. And um, I got to tell you, I had a lot of fun with uh, the April special anthology, but uh at the end of the day, I'm going to have to go with, let me see here. I'm going to see if I can. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go with um, the Godzilla. I'll have to go with Godzilla. Uh, yeah. Justice League versus Godzilla. That's and a worthy selection. Uh, I thought, I mean, Batman 89 echoes. I thought, sort of a triumphant return problem is it shouldn't have been necessary right because it's gone for four months but that that yeah. book uh it may be being slept on a little but again four months so what do you expect so i can't I, no way i can give it to that um just based on the, the fact that it was four months but that series does have a lot of potential i thought hellblazer dead in america is as <laughs> you know tough as it was a little bit impenetrable to get to really understand everything that was going on in that story i think it's still brilliantly done by Cy Spurrier uh, and what PKJ is doing in Green Lantern War Journal, I think also uh, 
really, really deserving, um, as well as Superman for the reasons we said, and Justice League versus Godzilla is what you picked. So that leaves me with Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman number seven, um, which again, I just, it was a nice interlude. Um, I get that some people may not want it losing mo the momentum, and I don't want Wonder Woman to lose momentum either. But I just thought this sometimes it's these kind of issues are really necessary. Uh, first of all, from a logistics side of things to give the artist a chance to, to catch up or to, to have a little rest. Um, but it's nice to just be reminded, like, why do we care about Wonder Woman as a character? Or what's special about her relationship with, with Superman? So, uh, yeah, there were some funny moments. There were some heartfelt moments. Uh, what I would really hope for this, because, yeah, I get that it can be jarring. I get that it was a bit of an interlude issue. Um, some could even say it had an inventory issue feel. What I really hope is that at some point going forward in the uh, in the regular story that we get an issue of the regular series that you know ties in and has a lot of stuff with the Sovereign that calls back to some of the things we saw in this issue to make it feel like this issue is more a part of the story overall. Because I could get why some people would say, "God, it just it, it felt I felt cheated." You know, I picked up. Wonder Woman expecting to get more of the Sovereign story, and I didn't get any of the Sovereign story. I could totally get that, how some people could feel that way. So, uh, But I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Brought a smile to my face. And, um, you know, you were talking before when we were uh, chatting about uh, World's Finest, how that was a one and done and reminded you of those Superman family stories. You know, this reminded me of those Superman family stories. This could totally have been one of those uh, stories in one of those anthologies uh, back in the day as well yeah. so uh all right well that's going to do it everybody don't forget to go check out our chat with uh, philip kennedy johnson um hope you all got a chance to read suicide squad dream team from nicole mains we had an interview uh with her recently so if you did read that uh dream team first issue and curious about more of the backstory and behind the scenes thinking of, from nicole you can go check out that interview have more interviews coming up um as well be it WonderCon in Anaheim at the end of the month. So if you're there, uh, always have comic source lanyards with me. I think I have a few left. So look for me. Uh, and, you know, it's always great to meet listeners, take pictures and that sort of thing if, uh, if you're interested. So uh, other than that, Daily Spawn continues every day over on the Comic Source YouTube channel. Just do a search for the Comic Source. You'll find us. Uh, if you're checking us out on the Comic Boom YouTube channel, we really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the notification bell. Uh, like this video, leave comments below. We really like to uh, to engage with people in the comment section. And if you're listening to audio only and you're looking for that Comic Boom YouTube channel, just go to YouTube, do a search for Comic Space Boom exclamation point, and you'll find us. Uh, for the comic source, you want to listen to the thousands and thousands of episodes that we have uh, audio only uh, on our podcast feed. Just go to wherever you listen to your podcast, favorite app, favorite platform, what have you. Do a search for the comic source and subscribe. Uh, and I think that does it. Uh, any last thoughts, Rocky? I uh, no, just uh, yeah. It was a it was a good week overall. I, I enjoyed this week. It was a lot of fun. Yep, definitely a great week for DC books. So uh, we appreciate the support, everybody, and we will talk to you next time. Catch you later.